Ko tainu i te waka, ko whakarongo tai te marai, ko te ati awa te iwi, ko ngā te raukawa te hapu, ko pasione iki lei tōku pāpa, ko Tyan Sancho Hohaia, tōku mama, ko Elia Tahou. It is a culture that can self-correct. Because if you go to a socialist country, they don't self-correct. If you go to a theocracy, uh, theocratic nations, they don't self-correct. But Western culture has been able to say, hey, look, this slavery thing actually is pretty bad. Hi, everybody. We have got Elliot Ekele here. He is the deputy leader of the New Conservative Party of New Zealand and he is currently running for an MP seat in the electorate of Takanini, which is an Auckland electorate. Elliot, you started the podcast in Māori. Um, do you want to say what you what you said in that? Oh, yes, Just translate yes. that for, for all of us who don't speak Māori. <laughs> so yeah, whakalofātu and whakalofātu to all your listeners out there. Thank you so much for having me. So what I started with was just a very basic mihi. I do not know parts of it, so I don't know what my awa and my maunga is, that's my mountain river. So it's it's effectively, it's more of a, mm, probably an origin placing back to where I came from, So which is a very common thing. So what I said was that the landing craft that I came in on, in terms of one of my blood links, would have been Tainui. Uh, the marae, or the meeting house that I come from in that bloodline is a place called Whakarongatai and then I went into my iwi which is Te Ateawa, Hapu which is Ngāti Raukawa, then into my dad who's, who's Pasione Laofoli Ikile and my mum who's Dian Sandra Hohaia um, and then myself so yeah. <laughs> cool. yeah. So you're, you've, you're Māori and? Uh, so yeah so I'm Māori, Tongan, Nguyen and English. Uh, probably raised up well, actually, all of my blood links, I would have been raised up culturally with them at some point at points in my life. So, so I really have been a bit of a, a mixy mix. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I say, and I include myself in this. We're all mongrels. We're all mongrels. Yeah, we're all mongrels. We're all mongrels. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how important to you is is your cultural background? I would say close to everything. It's a, I think it's a really important part. Whether you're, whether it's cultural, because it's actually historical mostly. So I remember my times of with my family and and uh, the cultural pinpoints within the development of my life are important because they imprint its own sense of identity upon me. That's why with many of the young people that I that that we work with a lot of them are missing or they've got gaps in their identity or their at least their sentimentality that gets attached to historical events that is their identity so it's not so much cultural but it's it's me it's who i am so we, we can say cultural but then i guess the culture of elliot would be all of that yeah mm. yeah um well actually just can we just go down that you mentioned identity mm. can you define what that means and and how you you sort of intimated that Ooh. that's important yeah, I know. <laughs> I suppose, and I'm just, I'm just, ch- I'm just speaking off the top of my head. I suppose identity would be our reaction to everything that has happened to us, and that could even go back even to genetics, and you know, not just what we experience and remember, even if it's uh, remembering before three years old, but also even in terms of how our uh, DNA and genetics sort of work and operate, which does have an effect on our lives uh, as we live, you know, whether it's good things, stronger bones, or whether it's weaker things, for example, uh, risks to various illnesses. So, yeah. Right, right. Um, and, I mean, I, I first um, came across you when I went to a debate about freedom of speech. Hmm. Now, do you want to just elaborate how you got into that, oh, yeah. and 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 you know the the um, you know the forerun to that? I mean, and if, if everyone listen, listens to my first podcast, it sort of talks about the event. Mm. Um, but do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah. So, so I was working as a trainer at the time, and I was also, of course, you know, as you mentioned, quite strong on free speech, and I'd done a few speakings uh, in the street and uh, Queen Street and things like that. So. 
So anyway, I was doing a job and then suddenly I got a call out of the blue and it was Don Brash. And he said, oh, look, Elliot, you know, I've gone through a few people and they've said no. Uh, and uh, so, but someone gave me your name. And this was two days out from debate. Can, we, can we just point out who Don Brash is? Oh, Don Brash. Yeah, just so for Don overseas Brash, listeners. Don Brash is the ex-leader of National. And he was also a guy who was in, he was infamous for giving what was termed at the time an, a, a racist speech at Ōrewa. Uh, uh, however, I'll be honest, I read it through three times. And while I found it a little bit dry, <laughs> actually, sorry, very dry, I did not find it boring. Uh, and also to a turn, but did you find it racist? Oh, there was absolutely zero racism, right. zero racism whatsoever in there, right. zero. That's all I knew. So, and I, I also point out this one: the first time I ever met Don was he didn't even know me, I didn't know him, and that was actually in the middle of Manurewa, which is in New Zealand is South Auckland, and most people would regard it as you know the hood. Uh, now I met him there, and he was just at a school that I was working at, the first charter school. And uh, I met him and he talked about, uh, oh, how's the kids? And he asked me about certain cases because I was the, I, I led the pastoral, the pastoral elements there. And so we had a great chat about kids and young people. And he was, he was a good guy. He, he just wanted the best for those kids. And he views it because he's a hardcore economist. In fact, I would put him at the top of the pile in terms of New Zealand, current economists in New Zealand. Well, he, he was the governor of the Reserve Bank as well. Governor of the Reserve Bank, yes. You know, leader of the New Zealand National Party. Yes, yeah. you, you can't, I think you can't get bigger than him. And I, I, I respect Roger Douglas, but I would put, I would actually rate uh, Don Brash as even more so. Um, so. So yes, he called me up and said, hey, hey, do you mind giving me a hand in this debate? And so I said, yep, no problem. Um, and <laughs> I guess I'm, maybe it's a bit of an Islander thing, but they, they got panicky because I even uh, about 20 minutes before the whole debate actually began, that's when I sort of rolled in. <laughs> said, Hi, guys. <laughs> and apparently they were all quite nervous because they thought I wasn't going to turn up. I said, oh, no, it's all right. I just have a particular reputation. <laughs> but we, so we did it. So we went in there. It was great fun. Uh, we even got led by security, and and so we you were escorted by security. We had massive uh, protests that occurred, but effectively uh, the, the the people there were really trying to shut down the ability to have a discussion and to put the ideas of of our very society uh, uh, in place. And really, you know, the protests actually already were on our side anyway because by them shutting down the ability to speak at all showed that our point was correct that that uh, i believe it was political correctness is actually suppressing free speech so it's, it's a wonderful example boom well it's that stephen pinker thing where he says if you turn up to a deb- debate um espousing negative things about freedom of speech you've already lost <laughs> yeah, yeah true true yeah. well said well said now um what I mean, well, first of all, the, the question I always ask people is, what is free speech, hmm. and why is it important? Why do we care? What is free speech? I suppose free speech. I suppose, from my point, I I would say that it's the ability to speak freely. <laughs> I mean, I know that sounds dumb as well, but but actually, I think that really does mean it: the ability to speak freely, to be unfettered, to. To not be, yeah, so I can be able to speak it if I think something is dumb or bad or good or cruel or, yeah, to, to not feel like if I speak something out that I'm going to be attacked for it. I, I would say, yeah, I would say that it's, I would say it's nearly self-explanatory, but I, I'll probably carve it by saying the, the, the ability to speak freely. I like that idea of freely, and so I'll, I'll be in that regard. Um, the other part of your question, what was it, the other part of your question? Why is it so important? Oh, oh why geez. do we care? Man, it is. It's utterly vital to our very lives because if you find something in society that is going absolutely wrong, you need to be able to bring it up without being having that shut down. If you've got, if I've if I've got a cyst, if you've got a, uh, well, mm, that's probably not the best example, but uh, you you just need to be able to bring up anything that's going wrong in a system or society or environment you've got to be able to bring up anything um and and i I believe i use this in the debate but for myself one of the biggest or when i realized that free speech really was actually becoming suppressed and or rather there was a chilling effect on suppression was when i asked in the middle of a meeting where is dad 
to a young person. I was in an HCN meeting. There was a young person there who had yeah, already escalated. What, what meeting? Oh, sorry, HCN. HCN meeting is when different groups go around and they sit around uh, a young offender and they'll each one is a t- particular group who'll do things, you know, whether it's put them in a home or... You know. So we're in a sort of a court proceeding. Uh, or... So that would be Oranga Tapadiki, which was yeah. SIFS back then, which yeah. is a child youth protection Right, uh, so you, you've got an offender who, who we're trying to work out yes. the best way forward. For yes, the, that's right, that's absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. And so we had that meeting, and then all of the groups were saying, oh, you know, we're going to give you, we're going to make sure, we're going to register you with a rugby, we're going to give you rugby boots and rugby uniform, we're going to make your dreams happen. Another one said, hey, you know what, you need to get to school, we're going to give you a bike, and... And all of these people were saying that, and the, the young person and the the support person were there, and he was just, he, 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 he looked half bored, half confused, and then I, I simply asked the question, hey, where's dad? Where's dad? And the boy trembled for a little bit, and then he just bawled out crying, just crying his eyes out. And the rest of the groups just stared at me as if I, <laughs> I don't know, as if I brought a gun in there or something like that. But they were absolutely appalled. And I realized, geez, we're not, why are you why are you why are we dealing with symptomatic issues but we're not going to the core issues first go to the core issues this is what's happening the boy has got no dad because the dad's a scumbag who did a runner and we need to look at that part and then let's look at getting a mentor and then on top of that then we can get a rugby shoes and free stuff you know then we can build it but with a chilling effect where oh no we don't want to talk about that we don't want to we don't want to go to those sorts of areas uh, it did disgust me. Now, in the, that particular case, I took that boy, and I believe we had him for the for like about five months. And as far in, as I'm in aware, your home, is that? Oh, not in my home. In the in the home that I was running at the time. Yeah. So I ran a behavior modification. So unit. you you do youth work essentially? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we brought him in, and in actual fact, he was because I was the one running the pro. Uh, sorry, I ran the team. He was my little well project, I suppose you'd say. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, he has now gone on and he's doing mining work over in Australia, loving it. He hasn't hurt people. He has not been in jail. You know, this is a boy who had been very escalating and violent behavior. And we were able to get him to be to have himself see that he should turn his life around and, and do good things. Or at least, you know, not doing bad, bad things. So uh, I think that's probably the point where I realized how bad things had gotten. Um, so you got some uh, some comeback for saying where's dad? Oh like, yes, like, like, there was actually yeah. specific comments to you. Yes, is that yes? What, what did they say? Yes. Uh, so uh, some, and this is not the first. Uh, sorry, that was the first time that I'd actually done it. But there's other times since then I've heard from some of the support people, which are usually either mums or um, grand mums. It's usually why are you asking a question? I don't need I don't need a man. I can do it myself. Um, I've had I've had other caregivers or parents and NGOs. They've said, "Oh, Elliot, you know, I we understand. I've now come. A, I've, I've got a particular reputation, <laughs> and so they have said um, along the lines of, we respect and understand what you're sort of asking for, but we feel that it actually could be um, a little bit not triggering, uh, a little bit damaging to their wider to their own." Uh, sense of self if you do bring up these questions but i've always maintained that actually doing taking away from that sort of discussion actually removes the very opportunity to gain resilience resilience i believe is actually at the core as to why we have or not the core one of the core reasons as to why we have so many suicides because you know you don't have resilience we have to hear harsh things we've got to be able to go through harsh experiences in order to gain resilience it can't be taught or anything like that so if we are also sitting there saying, well, don't tell me things that I'm going to disagree with, then what we're doing is we are, we're cottoning ourselves against logic and reason in the very world itself, which is not, not only not sustainable, it's, it's foolish. It's nearly, I would say, idiotic. Right. Do you, do you know the concept of anti-fragile? Have you heard that? No, I haven't. So heard that. Nassim Taleb, who's oh, uh, I know that I know that yeah, that, yeah, so that the, person. Yeah. So he came up with the concept of anti anti-fragile. Mm. He wanted to come up with a um, a word that describes systems or you know people or whatever um, that gain from ad- adver- adversity. Is that you know the thing of if, yeah. if, if it doesn't yeah. tell us, it, it makes us stronger. Yes. Um, and. And I, yeah, I agree with you, skirting around things. That example to me seems like we don't want to hurt 
the boy's feelings, mm. assuming he was a boy. Yep. Uh, um, and so you've got someone who is suffering, and so it's sort of, um, you know, it's like all things, the intentions are good, mm. but the, the, the way it's manifested actually is not necessarily helpful to the, the yes. person in question. Yep. Yeah. And there's a, there is a sense of, because, if, for example, if you've got a boy there who's, whose father has just passed away from cancer, for example, and you're discussing it with a boy, then yes, you, you wouldn't in terms of that, yeah. because there's a way in which you can gain that. Yeah. But if, you're, if you are talking in the case of a dude who's engaging in a straight gangster behavior, and no one has actually really brought it up, actually you should be piercing through mm. that hardened shell of mm, reaction and, and be able to get to the core. I mean, the fact that he broke down, you said he broke down, although that is, in a, in a sense, creating pain yes. within him, but in a sense, psychological growth can only be gained yep. by that, that realisation of the truth, like, where is my dad? Well, that's absolutely you know, right. That's it's, absolutely right. It's, it's, it's he, he may never have thought it, or he may be thinking it every moment of the day. Yes. But someone bringing it up to me, it actually shows, um, as sort of a, a objective observer, mm. It would be showing me how much you care for him, mm. not the opposite, yep. which is what your colleagues were saying to you, in a yes. sense. Yes. You don't care because you're hurting him. Yep, well said. Yeah. Well said. Yep. Um, so to me, that, that brings up, just getting back to the, the concept of freedom of speech, in a sense, there's two, two areas of freedom of speech. There's the personal, mm. when you're in a closed room with colleagues or friends or family or whatever, and your ability to say what what needs to be said, mm. and obviously this sort of has to this goes without saying. We're not talking about going in there and freely abusing people and being nasty to people. It's it's not a matter of of um, saying negative things for the just for the sake of saying negative things, but it's about saying when you have got something important to say that is that is what you believe is truthful. Mm. Um, that you need to be in an environment where that can be said, and any diminishment of that is actually not helpful. You're not you're not taking taking the process forward. So there's that sort of almost intimate freedom of speech, and then there's the public freedom of speech, which in a sense, when I went to that debate um, that you were you were in alongside Don Brash, there was you know a group of probably 50 protesters, and they literally tried to close the whole thing down. So if they had been successful, which um, in you know, various protest groups around the world um, that I've heard of, you know, they have been quite successful. I mean, the, the classic one is a bomb threat. Yes, and then you yeah. can't do, you know, another one, as I heard the other day, was pulling the, you know, pulling the wires of the speaker out. Um, but if they had been, in a sense that your, your right to public free speech would have been um, declined. Mm. I mean, personally, I think, in a way, that situation was was quite interesting because you know they were very vocal they tried to close it down but in a way we the whole community won in the end mm. because they didn't close it down and i think they realized and they stayed and well some of them stayed and listened didn't they yeah yes i, I thought that was actually really good um i mean they could have just been like really narcissistic and then just stayed the whole way through just wanted to shut it down completely but i I don't know for sure. It's a bit of conjecture, but I think maybe sort of like what you said. They, they. I mean, they did calm down a bit, and they did leave. Most of them left, but they it nearly felt as if there was a little bit of New Zealander left in them a little bit. So, you know, I don't know how that sounds, but what what do you mean by that, New Zealand? I suppose because what, New Zealand, what does New Zealand mean? We're very, you know? we're very, we have historically been a very polite and conservative nation. Very much polite and conservative, and yes, I'm sure that there are there are, and I think you can actually mix up the ideas of the British, the British origins as well as actually the Māori, Māori tikanga, because for example in Māori tikanga, can, yeah, can you again mm, for people non so, Māori speakers? So tikanga? when I mean uh, tikanga, I mean like a uh, cultural rules, rules of the the protocols. Right. So when you go on to a marae, for example, you have the mihi, you have the welcome, and then at, at that welcoming side. You've got the you've got the komato, you've got the the or you've got the the people who are uh, hosting the environment. There's always this this protocol where you have a discussion back and forth. Who are we and what are we doing here? Pretty much, and it, it, so that's a time of peaceful words, uh, of, of just gentle words. That and so actually this has to do with Don Brash too. So I was very honoured to go along with Don to the, the lower marae, uh, Teti marae, uh, in the in Waitangi. Uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, and uh, so when we were there, he knew 
the, he had been invited there by one of the elders, and I was there to sort of uh, be his sort of shoulder companion. And we, at the time of the meeting, they all knew that they didn't really like Don, or, or most of them did not, but it didn't matter, because at that part of the greeting, it was all words of gentleness, unity, peace, love, and it was absolutely fine, you know, it was great. What then, because that's the that was that part, then came the part afterwards where you were expected and allowed to engage in, in strong war, you know, words of war, words of power, you know. <laughs> and that's great because it said that, yeah, this is a time where, no, we, we all polite, we all relax, we all have a turn, we're all together, and then after that we'll go there, we'll have a bit to eat, and then we'll come into this other area, and then it's a powwow. And even the powwow is a very respectful powwow. Yeah. It's harsh and strong, but it's in its place. The New Zealand context is, uh, in terms of British, you know, there is that that whole nearly aristocratic, perhaps, its origins where, you know, we, we wait, I say something, then I wait for this other person to say something, and there's, and there's a rule, you know, the invisible... The invisible rules of culture and etiquette. Right. Yeah. Mm. I mean, what you described in a way, it's a bit like a, a rugby game in reverse. Mm. In a rugby game, you know, you have all these big burly guys smashing each other, and then afterwards they hug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, I, yeah, I always, yeah, I always yeah. love that. Yeah. And in a sense, what you're saying in that Mariah situation, your, your, your sort of, um, um, en- enhancing the bonds. And and basically saying to each other we're friends, yeah. you know, and we're we're friends and we're equal, and 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 fa- we're family in a sense. Yes, yeah. And yeah. and and like families, we will then go and speak frankly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Nicely said. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So one of the things that I'm really interested in, in is hate speech. Mm. Um, hate not speech. hate <laughs> speech. Yeah, not not to do it myself personally, <laughs> but um, you know, basically, um, if I got if I sat here and started um, hurling epithets about your your race and your background, oh, yeah. and all that sort of stuff, um, brown scumbag, yeah, whatever, you know, all, all all those sort of you know all those words, um, um, you know, that's hate speech mm. apparently. Um, what are your thoughts on that? You know, because as as far as I'm aware, I'm not. I have. I'm. I'm. Am going to get a lawyer on, but I haven't managed to find one yet. Um, to to really drill down to this, so I'm not exactly sure what you can and can't say. Well, effectively, but, it's defamation and violence, or, or yeah, incitement yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. No, well, then the definitely the, the easy cite, stuff. The, yeah, the incitement and violence. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But but you're in terms of the is, hate, what is defined as hate? Defined as hate. Yeah, speech. you're talking about that heart, that that weirdly vague part where it says disharmonious and. Uh, yeah, I don't. I'm not a big fan of that. I think it should be uh, calling for violence, or, or you know, directly calling for violence. Or defamatory, and then that's it, and everything else is, is okay. So I can sit here and, and say all sorts of racist, yeah. nasty things to Black you. Nigger, I've been called <laughs> I've been called nigger so many times when I was younger. Yep. A lot browner than I was now, but yep. I, I was called nigger quite a lot when I was younger. Yeah, by both family, friends, and people who just didn't like me. Right, uh, but and, and and in terms of you know their what I I like to um, uh, my term for it is people with high degrees of melanin as opposed to <laughs> high degrees skin, of melanin. As, a, as opposed to. <laughs> To, to Palangis like me, yeah. who have got yeah. unbelievably low degrees of melanin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's how pathetic I think this whole discussion is. Oh, yeah, because yeah. when oh. you when you put it in those terms, it's like, well, it's just it's the degree of melanin in your skin, yep. right? Yep. And it's it's to me, it's um, it's sort of dehumanising even talking about it in yep. a sense because in a way we're more human than mm. we are. That that's the least important thing about our humanity. Yeah. Anyway. Oh um, no, you're right. and actually oh, this one of my little pet peeves, but I know even even some of my friends use it and I mean it in a good way. But I, I laugh sometimes when I hear the word oh people of colour, people of colour. So I'm sitting there thinking, when was it okay to call coloured people people of colour just by swapping the words around? Yeah. And so you get heaps of the, the lovely students from Torbay and North Shore going, Oh, you can't talk about people of colour like that. It's like, dude, what? You just call me a coloured person. Bro, shh, not the <laughs> hey. Um, well, Stephen Pinker talks. Talks. Um, he's got a term for it, which is um, the euphemism treadmill. <laughs> euphemism treadmill. So, so we used to <laughs> used to you know it used to be able to used to talk about the jungle. Yep. Right. And then that became um, politically incorrect. Now it's the forest. Or well, then it was the forest. <laughs> and now it's the rainforest. Oh, I see. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, so I mean, so in a, in, a, in a way. But again, I think, you know, to give, um, you know, to, to give people their credit, 
you know, in a sense, people are just trying to be nice, aren't they? Do you know what I mean? They're trying to think because if you have, you know, the 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 you know the worst word of all, the N word, Mm. um, and they're thinking, oh my God, we can't, you know, we want to move away, as far away from from something like the N word, and so they get to people of colour. Yeah, and and and, in a sense, in a sense, I mean, personally, I don't care what people call themselves or you know whatever. You're right. You're right. If it's people of color or colored people or or African American or African American, but or Polynesian or Palangi, you know, I mean, Palangi, which which um, just for non non Polynesian speaking people is um, Polynesian word for white people, isn't it? I suppose it would be, but then they don't. Well, we don't have a, really have a word for Asian, for example. So, right. So Balangi. Right. See, Pakia. I was taught. I was always taught that Pakia, which is the Maori word for white people. For or European. I was actually taught. See, I was mm. taught that it was uh, for non Maori. Ah. So whether you happen oh, to be so you can be Chinese Asian. or so you can be black, African, you can be black or, yeah, black, black, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. 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 Um, so, I, but honestly, the whole the whole thing about words. I mean, words are cool. You know, words are evolutionary. Yeah, I, yeah. I can get that. But uh, um, you know, I think. In terms of the words, and if you if you, we will all come across dickheads in our lives. We're all going to come across bullies. We're all going to come across people who are not nice, and you know they'll use whatever words they can do. And one of the more unfortunate or more escalating things that I've seen recently, probably over the last maybe just the last ten years, twelve years, is a huge increase uh, in usage of passive aggressive word of phrases very passive aggressive and just needling and undermining sort of words got got examples so uh, i guess uh, i don't know if there are some there are some i can use that are quite recent but i'm trying to avoid those but for example let's see if you're sitting there going uh um oh you're you're yeah i don't i don't I don't mind doing your work for you. I understand that it's really hard for you to do your work. It's because I, I'm, I'm happy to help you. It's a shame that you're not able to do your work, but but that's all right. I'll, I'll help out. I'll keep on helping out, even though you can't do it. Uh, and you know that sort of undercurrent constantly sort of undermines. So what, what are they actually quiet. saying? What are, what they're saying is that they. I mean, someone said that to you, or no, no, to, they said this. it to someone I know. Right. So it's a so they're going through that sort of process. They are in a work situation, uh, and that person is doing that sort of sort of thing. But ah, so in that sort of circumstance, the person was um, the person who was doing the passive aggressive attacks had been made redundant in that particular position and then they had to do another some more the boss had given them another job and that job had uh, partially overlapped with this other job that had that person got made redundant redundant and then this the two people the person i know and this other person had to do this one job this other person had an issue with it but instead of saying i don't want to do that work i can't do it properly or i just don't want to do it instead of saying it that way it was more that look i've got my plates full i understand you can't do this yourself and i uh, you know but i'll help out even though i understand that you can't do it and so there's this it's underlying areas of of frustration and the ability to say well i'm not saying that i don't want to do it i'm just saying you can't do it you know, I want to help out, you know. So it's a. I found I found that passive aggressive things always a little bit more frustrating, but it could be a personal thing, or or something connected to my archetype, my own right. personal archetype. Um, but I find that over the last ten years, things like passive aggressive, uh, needling, um, just uh, removing using political correct words to actually go around and attack people is has become a lot more popular. Uh, and I suppose things like you're racist. You're a racist. You're a xenophobe. You're a homophobe, transphobe, uh, anything like that. You know, just to attack. If you, if I say something that that someone else disagrees with, then they can come to me and say, "Well, I'm a racist because I dis- because they disagree with my speech." So have you have you been called? Oh. Those <laughs> give me give me the list let's of what see. you've been called. Yeah, yeah, let's see. Oh, transphobe, ha, ah, transphobe, homophobe, uh, racist, uh, xenophobe, um, oh, far right. In fact, I think I've been called far right by some media. Uh, Alt right, uh, which I still haven't figured out exactly what that is. Um, oh, race trainer, coon. Uh, been called coon a few times. In fact, I got coon, called coon at that debate that you've referred to. Um, race traitor, Uncle Tom. Uh, what else? 
Yeah, I think uh, uh, I think that might be. Yeah, there's a few others I'm sure, but there's a there's a list. And just out of interest, from what um, you know, where, who's saying this? And in, in terms of politi- <laughs> p- politically, yep, is it is it across the board? One no. would su- one would suspect you know, the law of averages, <laughs> the law of averages, that yeah. that it would be you know some on the left, some in the middle, some on the right. Oh no, gosh no, 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 the right generally don't. Uh, uh, um, Have you ever been called any anything nasty by anyone on the right? Uh, there are some things that I don't. I think that some on the right are just straight racist, but that's very few, very few. No, no, but have they have they called, called you? Me. No, I don't think so. Right. Um, no. No, I'm I'm searching my own little database, but uh, no. So just the fact you have to think about yeah, it. Yeah, the fact yeah. I have to think about now, it. Now, okay, so h- oh, hit me with, oh. who, where does it come from? Uh, um, usually, <laughs> and I apologize, I oh, know I don't apologize for it, white liberals. Yeah. Or perhaps not white liberals, what's white a, leftists. What's a white, white leftist? Yeah, okay, what's a white leftist? A white leftist is one who generally has grown up in a lovely home, mum and dad, and cat come and, cops come and get your cat out of the tree sort of styles. They don't really understand the hood. They don't understand. Uh, sort when of when you say the when you say the hood, you mean basically lower socioeconomic. Yes, areas. lower socioeconomic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. I, I was raised and grew up in, in mostly that. A couple of times I went to maybe a few years I went to uh, middle class sort of areas, but uh, so, most so, of my life. So was, it, the the working uh, work, oh, yeah. working class or unemployed. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah totally. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of where I come from. So these guys got no, very few of them have much idea about this at all. Right. Uh, and I've yet to really come across one who does. Uh, so they're very much, uh, or, or those who have been swept into the more race baiting stuff. So there are a few, oh, I would say it's a minority, but a few Maori, but Maori who are in certain geographic areas that are known to be more, uh, hotbeds of wokeness or, or very far leftist or liberal type of ideas, far liberal ideas. So, uh, uh, I mean, more, so we're more going, sort of wealthy Maori, essentially, is what you're saying, or not? I wouldn't say wealthy. So, yeah. for example, I'm going tonight, I'm going out to West Auckland. Now, there are quite a few spots out there where it's just straight, uh, I, I call it the woke West. <laughs> <laughs> see in South Auckland you won't really see a lot of the, the woke stuff you won't yeah. really see a lot of the far leftist sort of things yeah. uh, West however you, you'll find uh, quite a few and, and it, perhaps it does have to do with a couple of the schools out there yeah. um, that have, have really pushed the ideology out there but um, but it, yeah so it's more central Auckland uh, West Auckland uh, North Shore uh, very interesting the young ones just seem to be more about socialism so it, it very so, much I mean it's in, I mean just for people who don't not from Auckland North Shore is one of the richest suburbs in, oh, New, in New Zealand yes yeah I, I would argue the yeah, <laughs> yeah I'd probably and, go for the and probably one of the whitest as yeah, well yeah I would go for that too yeah, yeah. Hmm. what's woke <laughs> woke yeah woo woke is oh gosh great one woke is mm, this this culmination of what we I would refer to as the leftist type of thought. Well, what's leftist? Well, leftist is where the ideology or the belief that uh, partly it's sort of the state or the government should be able to to fix a whole lot of the problems, but specifically the problems around uh, the new ideologies, uh, LGBTQIA plus ideologies, uh, critical race theory, um, uh, men are bad, women are good. Uh, so very much divisive and at the same time driving meaningless meaning meaninglessness uh, within our various identities uh, so it's a it's quite a fascinating it's quite a fascinating uh, cultural phenomenon I think but it's something which is actually hurting us and I, I argue would result in a ideological replacement not just New Zealand but across the Western world. One thing I find interesting is um, with the woke phenomenon is the lack of interest in dialogue. Oh yes, and and or maybe I should put it another way: with the lack of interest in dialogue, that causes the slightest bit of cognitive dissonance. Mm. So mm. so as if you it's fine if you're talking within the paradigms that they perceive are correct. If you're talking outside that paradigm, um, the conversation stops. Hmm. Now, what? Why do you think that is? 
And is, why do you think that is? And is that healthy? Is it healthy oh. to have a whole area of discourse which mm. cannot be discussed? And if you discuss it, um, you're you're thrown in the the rubbish bin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the second, I mean, this, I'll answer your second one is the easiest one to answer. No. <laughs> <laughs> but why? why? Being thrown into a gulag is, is probably less than, than lovely. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of the first one, I have often thought about this. I mean, you, so it's easy to find the indicators. They get very emotional. They they have a very low resilience. They And I say they because it is a bit of a collective. Uh, and even the term, the, the conservative term, the left eats itself, is actually something which is quite accurate. Uh, after a while and i think there's a great speaker a, a great lady she's a she's very much a, a she was a very strong and is probably a strong real activist for for lesbian rights uh, annie o'brien but she has been absolutely brutalized by because they have called her a turf trans exclusionary radical feminist and they've tried to shut her down and engage in cancel culture across the board and so she's actually a great example of someone who is, was was part of the quote unquote left, who has now been uh, just absolutely persona non grata times fifty, and uh, has attacked for it. So very much low resilience, very emotional, strongly in terms of a collective, strongly a collective. So if you are outside, as you said, the paradigm aspect, then you are actually going against the very humanity of that collective, which of course is an, uh, is absolutely illogical and also highly damaging to any form of understanding us as individuals. There is no individual. So, you, you know, and this is where you get into some big questions about, well, what are we actually looking at? Are we actually looking at the the ideas around some of the dystopian, uh, or the novel writers of dystopian futures as George Orwell and, and uh, those sorts of guys? And I would argue, actually, yes. <laughs> I think we're having, and it reminds me of a very recently, the Black Lives Matter leaders, I wouldn't even say admitted, they proudly proclaimed that they were trained Marxists. That's actually what they call themselves. We are trained Marxists. And so when you're talking about the very uh, ideas that many young ones are actually subscribing to, uh, socialism, uh, uh, socialism, communism, fascism, you know, the children of Marx, so to speak, then I think we are, we are moving into an area where our youth and our young people, even up to the 20s and 30s, are... Uh, engaging in, in these ideological identities as opposed to individualism or at least a more central form of, of uh, group group identity. I am a Pacifica guy, uh, but I'm Elliot at the same time. I'm able to live in those worlds because I'm a centrist, whereas those guys over on the far one have taken collectivism to a, to a horrifically, to a very scary area where if we question, then you are actually against. And that's Historically speaking, ooh, that's pretty fatal. Hasn't worked out well for the <laughs> hundreds of millions of people who <laughs> are six feet under. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yes, exactly. Mm. Mm. Um, but again, you know, again with you know, I have conversations with with you know, so called young people. That is, people younger than me. Uh, <laughs> no, but you know, people in twenties and thirties and stuff. Mm. And it is, you know, I think the interesting, you know, and I would describe them on the the woke the woke spectrum, um, and I'm not saying that in a disparaging way, but... Um, I would. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> free you know, speech, free speech. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think the, the key thing is they... It's coming... It is actually coming from a place of, of caring, and it, in a sense it's coming from a, a good place, but it's sort of like they're wanting to achieve A... But as I would see it, they're not quite doing it with the right tools. Or they're, they're doing it with tools they don't really know the outcomes of. You mean like the road to hell and all that sort of yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah, you know, the road to hell's I mean, good intentions. I mean, so, was, was Hitler a really, really a bad person? Was Stalin? Was Pol Pot? Uh, you know, was... Uh, uh, well, I had, I had to say, I, I think yes, but <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to say? I mean, I mean, when we look at some of the most ruthless people, when we look at some of the... It's like when you look at a picture of a, of a, a, a real a mass murderer. Mm. Um, you'll find a baby picture somewhere. They'll look beautiful. They'll be in a doll's carriage. They'll be hugged by mm. by someone. There's someone's likely. Son. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so if, you know, 
the the whole good intentions thing is is lovely <laughs> and you're right you're right when it comes to a, when it comes to a discourse but, that we're having but essentially i mean you know i i, I know we i i understand what you're saying mm. but it's you know i'm we're not talking in extremes you mm. know we're not i'm not having conversation with young hitlers um you know having com- you know when you have conversation with very smart very intelligent people um and and what concerns me with the the reduction of freedom of speech or the the um may, the closing down the overton window which is you know the, the what's sort of allowed to be said mm. uh, you know the discourse that we're allowed to have is that a lot of a lot of times these people don't ever hear any other side yes and if they hear the other side it's um always in a negative negative way so they may hear you and then they'll read oh he's he's a you know, race trader or whatever that term was you, you said, you know, he's he's a racist or he's a transphobe or whatever, you know, because someone has thrown that that um, epithet at you and as most mud does, it sticks, mm. right? So, um, yeah, it's it's very interesting that this, this, you know, recent generation who have never had it better than anyone ever. Oh, man, try telling them that. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, are actually wanting to to have less conversation mm. than more, and I I think personally I think it comes back to what you're talking about the 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 vulnerability, um, and and also the thing of them only hearing one argument. Would you agree that or why Western societies have been so successful is that we've used dialogue over force? I I would say I mean that's definitely. I think the ability to have free speech and the dialogue aspect of it has come from what Western culture is, which of course is the governance structure of Western democracy uh, and the, of course, the, the object of morality of Judeo-Christian principles. So I, I think that free speech comes from those two things. And especially in New Zealand, of course, we paid for that in a lot of blood. So the being able to sort of discuss that. And, and that's what I love. I think that Western culture is, no, no, not that I think. Western culture is the most the greatest culture in the history of mankind as far as i'm concerned is it the best no no it's not because humanity is flawed we are fundamentally flawed but western culture i have found to be the the greatest historically there's nothing better now 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 some people would say there's a degree of racism (laughs) yeah they would (laughs) okay so why would they say that again because because whoever leads them their ideological positioning uh, that's that is so when they they talk about colonialism or in other uh, areas slavery for America or you know they'll look at anything bad that they can find and then they'll they'll grow that grow that out. But the reason why I love uh, Western culture is not so much not just because it's the most charitable, most uh, advancement for sciences, most uh, productive and strongest, and also has been uh, the basically you find a cessation in military conflicts generally between democracy democracies don't really go to war with each other generally um, but not only that it's self-correcting it is a it is a culture that can self-correct because if you go to a socialist country they don't self-correct if you go to a theocracy uh, theocratic nations they don't self-correct but western culture has been able to say hey look this slavery thing actually is pretty bad and so suddenly you've got a, a within the governance structure and the principle structure, the object of morality, they were able to to slavery. It was actually Western culture, a Western culture style nation that was able to stop, uh, abolish slavery first. Mm. And there's still slavery in, in parts of the world, but you won't find it in Western nations. Uh, so I, I do, I absolutely love it. So when you've got people who say, ah, oh, colonialism, all that, at piecemeal, you can even break that because you can see that some people do bad things. Some leaders are... are doing bad things within it but the society the system that is built by that is western culture underpinning is they are they are offending that culture they're not in line with it uh sorry so, who are offending oh if you've got someone like a if you've got a bad a bad ruler uh, in in a nation then see, oh, i was going to use lyndon main johnson with the black americans but it's not a very not a very accurate example for what we're talking about, but uh, if you've got a if you've got a bad leader who's um, doing bad things and they're outside of the cultural uh, the culture that it is Western culture, then they will come to an end pretty quick, fast. Uh, I suppose. Oh, I suppose um, Nixon might be a decent example. The idea of at least being honest and transparent 
uh, and he was found out and he admitted it, then he had to go. He had to get gone. Um, so in the US area, you know, you can have be indicted. Um, in the New, New Zealand environment, it's a little bit different. And I think we're, we're testing that currently. I think we're actually, New Zealand, I think, is in, in the most, well, I've said this before, but New Zealand is in the most important election cycle ever since uh, 1852. Uh, I think uh, this is nothing compared to Holyoke days or Savage or Palmer when he built up Bora, uh, I- anyone else. I think this goes back to the Constitution of or the so Constitution what, Act. So why why do you th- why do you say that? Why is it so important today? Yeah, because I mean, you know, to be fair, every politician says every oh, election yeah. is yeah. the most important, most important one in our are. generation. <laughs> Absolutely right. The reason why I say it from a probably from what I can see is a. a uh, factual point of view is because over the years you've had one or two of the the pillars, which is of course you know Greek democracy or Western or you know, governance structure and uh, objective morality structure. We've had one of them go try to be eroded and removed at different times, but never before at the same time, and never so, as so, effectively. So who? How is that manifesting itself? So I suppose, for example, um, uh, in terms of democracy, we've seen. The select committees have been slashed down in terms of times. The uh, sneaky uh, sneaky signing of the UN Migration Compact, for example, which was only admitted in the last hour of the last day of 2018. The uh, the way the, the disgraceful way in which the firearms amendments were brought in, they just slashed through everything there. Uh, even the Section 11 powers given to them uh, via the COVID response bill. On the other side, you can see that uh, from the very start, the removal of Jesus in prayer, the influx of gender ideology that's going through our, our uh, education system right now and has just been confirmed to be even in primary school or to be pushed into primary schools now. Can you um, elaborate what is gender sorry, ideology? Sorry, right. So we were actually the party who uh, exposed that there is a gender ideology style program. Gender ideology is when children are encouraged to question their gender, that they're not a boy or a girl, but that they're on some spectrum. Now, this has already been going in, in the UK, uh, uh, the UK for uh, about 10 years or 12 years, and all, they've got horrific stats now because they can fight, they see now that it's actually a social contagion. But Canada, US, Australia, and we were the we were the ones to get it with, the, pretty much the last to get it, I think. And so so what was that, how does that, just if we can go into the detail of that, because it's quite interesting. Um, how, what, you know, today children, we're going to discuss whether you're a male or a female. Okay, so, how does it work? So so the Mates and Dates program goes from year 9 to year 13. What's it called? And, uh, Mates and Dates program. Mates and Dates. Yeah, yeah. What so, does that mean? Well, it was touted as a anti-sexual violence, anti-bullying, uh, healthy relationship sort of program. It's funded by the taxpayer under the ACC. We forced the government to actually give us the facilitator's handbook. <laughs> and what we found was quite shocking. Uh, it's threaded throughout the entire program, it's just the pushing of LGBTQI plus but mostly the ideas around uh, transgenderism and gender identity issues so at first it looks at encouraging so the first couple of years it looks at encouraging you to understand the difference between gender uh, gender and identity uh, gender and sex then how to be an ally uh, and one of the year 10 year 12 uh, scenarios that i remember reading was one where you've got to pick a, a scenario out of something like five or six scenarios and most of them are actually um, either lesbian, gay, or transgender scenarios. So you're not looking about fat people, or, or black or brown, or poor or rich, or um, nerdy, or jockey, or you know, it is smart or, or dumb. No, no, it's very much focused around the, the ideas of um, you know, uh, male uh, gender and uh, allyship and you know, LGBTQIA+. Mm-hmm. So we found that out, but two, two and a half weeks ago, we actually put it out again out to the public, but Tracy Martin, who's a who's a minister in New Zealand, she has just released uh, Minister of Education documents. Now it's actually uh, we thought Mason dates were bad. It wasn't bad. Now it has been currently pushed out to all the schools to be embedded into the educational programs, into lesson plans, and that's not just high school. Now it's going from five year olds, and so they've it's all it's all. It's all documented, it's all Ministry of Education uh, focused, and it's got it. So, for example, seven-year-olds are now being encouraged to, uh, I believe the quote is, interrogate colonization and what colonization has done to sexual orientations and the suppression of sexual identity in New Zealand. Uh, And uh, this is seven- and eight-year-olds. Seven- and eight-year-olds are also to 
uh, look further deeply into gender and I, uh, gender and sex and the differences between the orientations. So you're talking about sexual appetite. You're talking about lust and uh, or at least I want to have sex with this other person. That's I mean that's effectively the orientation part of it, uh, which we this, find. This to be, is why they're not doing their ABCs. Yes, and their so literacy, literacy, and you know mm-hmm. all of that. Nah, mm-hmm. mate, let's let's because confuse that's them. all done, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, somehow they've got time to stick all that in. Right. So uh, uh, yeah, so when you talk about that, both both pillars are being removed out, uh, and not a, and the other second part is is that it's actually not nationwide; it's actually culture wide. So you know, again, Australia, uh, US, Canada, C sixteen, and uh, uh, most of Europe and the UK, especially, uh, that it's we've seen this at a cultural level, not a nationwide level. So that's why this year is most important because this year we do we win it, we win everything back, or we lose the rest of what we've got. And is this um, what coming from the Labour Party? Where, the Labour it, Party, where's it coming from? The Labour Party are the worst. Um, the Labour Party are the worst. Uh, the National Party are just a little bit behind. So the two major parties, Labour the, is the but, worst. The, but, so the National Party have uh, been inculcated with this ideology as well. Yeah, well, they don't. Yeah, they won't do anything to fix it. Too hard. Uh, they. I think they don't care. Mm. Yeah, and, and I say that carefully. But I think that they don't care because if you look at even national, they started to push a lot of the woke stuff as well. Um, and I mean, the the person leading the charge on the what we have now as the most brutal abortion bill in the Western world uh, was actually national. It was actually a national. Um, Amy Adams, the the MP, the National Party MP. Just that, I mean, what interests me about you, you're very knowledgeable. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, you, 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 you've got a very clear understanding of the, the underpinnings of, of what, what makes our society our society. Hmm. Where did that come from? Well, tell, tell me about your, back, your background. Oh, gosh. Well, there's no letters. There's no letters behind my name. Yeah, you're not a doctor. There's no of, Elliot. Uh, not MS. a doctor of philosophy. <laughs> no, no. In fact, the, the joke is... Uh, the joke is, is that, oh, what school did you go to earlier? Hard Knocks. I went to the school of Hard Knocks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, probably for the first part of my life, I was heavily into drugs and alcohol, and I was very angry, so, very angry. So, what, what up to 20? Up or to what? 25. 25. And yeah. where, did that, where did that come from? Um, oh, well, I, was, I came up in uh, different broken homes. So, I, I was raised in broken homes. Um, raised with dad, and then went with mum. Both those relationships sort of broke down as well. Um yeah, so I was quite angry and all that sort of stuff. And Heavily into drugs. The drugs, the drugs fix it. Oh gosh, no, jeez. <laughs> the drugs. But they fix it for a moment. Yeah, yeah, coping. Yeah. So when you look at alcohol and drugs, I, I, I view now, I can see that. Yep, I was using them as coping mechanisms. <laughs> Worst type of coping mechanisms you can find, mm-hmm. but they were my coping mechanisms. So I was just blazed out of my brain most of the time. I just didn't want to think. I just wanted to be numb to the world. Um, so you, I mean, what what I find interesting, why I'm asking you about this, hmm. um, and again, I don't want to, if you don't want to get oh, too I'm personal good. or anything, I'm good. but, um, you know, when I have discussions with young people, it's essentially you're the, pe- you're the person they're caring about. Hmm. You're the person who, you know, they've told me in no uncertain terms, you know, that if, say, something is said X, Y, Z, hmm. that you'll be the person who's psych- psychologically harmed. Hmm. What's your reaction to that? Since you are actually you're the you've come from a broken home, you've come from you've no no not a great history in education. Is that what you're saying? Oh yeah, man. yeah, yeah. I was, I was half stoned through my uh, school C days. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so you're the person they're caring about. Mm. So why shouldn't they care? Is, is that is that what you're saying? They should. Is there is their care, their kindness, and their empathy? misplaced or is it actually and you know essentially i'm talking about the the, the woke ideology the woke here right, right. you know because it, again, again to give them their fair due it is coming from i think it is coming from most people who don't fully understand the origins of it mm. coming from a good place yeah i i see but again in a way it goes back to that that discussion you had about when you said where's dad yeah all those other people in the room they're not nasty people yes, they're you're just right. trying to help yeah, right. You're right. You're right. You're right. And even the even the boy himself, even though he he was escalated in assaults and stuff like that, he is himself. He's a broken shell. Yeah. Um. So yeah, you yeah, know. So, wh- so and, why and are they fact, wrong in the sense? And in actual fact, yeah. So when I do talk to some of the wokies, I do love to just sit down and talk with them. Um. And I, I mean, the first rule of youth work, 
shut up. <laughs> shut up and just listen. <laughs> and so that's that's what I do a lot. And so if it, if I come across a woke person, I'm happy to sit there and listen. Just listen, listen, listen. Um, and then I let them get out their pain and struggles. And then they're at a then there's a window where we can discuss and, and have a chat. And at those points, yeah, you're right. It, it is quite good. I think perhaps 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 over the last year year and a half, I've become so inured maybe i've become so uh, used to, to battling in the public sphere that it has changed not my not my ideas and opinions and understandings but my perhaps my methodology in terms of how i speak it out for example i'll go straight out i, I will go straight up to groups and say oh, there's two genders two in fact i did that at, at the university earlier this year i i went up to the green supporters and i said there are two genders <laughs> And they loved it? Oh, they loved it. Um, well, I'm sure they did. They seemed yeah. to react very, in a dynamic fashion. I actually, I read on your um, your your Wikipedia bio that well, you were banned from Twitter for saying oh, something, was, yeah, along, I was banned from Twitter. So, something along those lines. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, so that was saying... There's, uh, a, there's uh, a woman called Megan Murphy, who yep. I didn't, knew nothing about until recently, but she's been she's been banned for tw- off Twitter forever for saying men are not women. Yes, yes. And yeah. I thought, you know, the other day I thought, oh, I wonder what this terrible person is like. So I thought I went onto a YouTube channel. You could not get... <laughs> she's a she's a hardcore feminist. Yep, yep. Um, you know, she could not get a nicer, more moderate person. Yep. So, yep. yeah. yeah and, and, and what I said also was trans women are men with a psychological dysphoria slash disorder to be treated with compassion and tolerance. <laughs> that's actually what I said. And that's what you got banned for. That's what I got banned for. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so so I, I think perhaps, because yeah, you've raised a good point, I think I've just become a nerd, so I've, I've, I've re- I have react now in a sense of, of, you know, the group collective saying this, so I will just say this in order to pierce that veil and then uh, have a massive uh, ruckus over it. So, so you, essentially you're, you're trolling them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's not necessarily, a, yeah, that's, I, but that's I, not necessarily yeah. a bad thing. No, no, it's that's a right, bit yeah, like yeah. you know, piercing a boil. Yes, you know? yes, yes. Um, yeah. And and so there's 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 um, sort of in a sense unspoken tension. Yes. And by saying something which yeah. which you believe is truthful, which I think most people would believe is truthful. Yep. I think yep. probably the dictionary would believe it's truthful <laughs> yeah, as well. Yeah, currently, yeah. Currently. Um, um, and um, you're you're actually. In, in a sense, it is it is still dialogue. It's dynamic dialogue. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, so still still valid. Yeah, you're right. In actual fact, actually, yeah, yeah because even on that particular uh, debate where I, or that university, yeah, the university debate where I, I you know, I said, then some uh, an LGBTQIA plus uh, spokesperson from the university came out and said, I mean, you know, do are you a homophobe? And I loved that because then he was coming to me one on one. He wasn't coming with a group. And then we engaged in the more one-on-one stuff. You know, nah, bro, man, I, I love you. You know, awesome. Uh, what are you doing? Are you studying? Yeah, awesome. So we were able to engage in yeah. in that beautiful discourse. And then I was able to ask, okay, well, what you tell me, what what is it that that I've done or that my policies are that is hateful towards LGBTQIA plus uh, people? And then we were able to have a great discussion about that. So I suppose there is that that you know the public and the the personal. And it came out with actually with a so I've. I've worked with about 30, I'm trying to work it out the other day, but just over 30 trans kids over my career. Not many, but I've loved in, every in single one of them. In your youth work. Uh, in my youth yeah, work, yeah. yeah. And I've loved every single one of them. And uh, in fact, one of my favorite t-shirts. So what you're saying is you're unbelievably transphobic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So totally transphobic. <laughs> Highly transphobic. Uh, and, and, you know, I do carry this particular, f- not fear, but concern um, I worry that some of those young ones who 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 I've been uh, honoured to be, walk along parts of their life with, that they'll see some of what the other people will say, and they'll say, "Man, that hurts me because I thought that guy uh, looked li- like me, loved me, and wanted the best things for me, and now these guys are saying they hate me." Um, and I was, I actually know I was worried about that until I came across a couple of Facebook threads where I was being attacked as per usual Mm -hmm. and actually a a particular name came out and it was saying nah man I know this guy this guy with my tutor back in best days he's Mm -hmm. awesome you shut up all of that sort of stuff Uh, and I realised aww (laughs) aww thank you well this is the thing 
the um, not you know I, I'll clearly state I'm not an expert on transgender issues, but um, the little that I've come across, um, it's not a monolithic um, uh, entity. There are there are trans people who don't think along yes. those lines. Yes, yes, um, and and they they you know they can be quite vocal. Yep. So I think that's this is the um, in a way a, a lot of those things like you know epithets like transphobic they're they're blunt instruments which yes, they just yep. pull out of the the rack you know you've, you've got a whole tool set racist yep, yep. Coon, transphobic you know anti-islam you know it's, and it's they all, pull it's them all down. titled with shut up yeah it's, it's under the shut, shut up, up. <laughs> yeah, yeah and it's it's also not an argument yeah, <laughs> yeah it's not an argument right yeah, yeah, yeah. you know racist is not an argument yep, yep. it's actually if, if you actually want to discuss how you you know feel about racism or, or ha, you know how get, you know you want to get down to the weeds. You yep. have a discussion. Yep. You know throwing throwing an epithet is actually going nowhere, and it says more about the person who's throwing it. It says their their lack of um, ability and enthusiasm to get into a dialogue. Mm-hmm. Um, um, one thing that's been, I mean, I interviewed um, Simon Wilson, lead lead writer. Uh, from um, the Auckland Herald, which awesome. is one of one of New Zealand's, you know, he's one of the New Zealand's lead lead journalists. One thing he he said to me, I can't remember what, what I was saying. It was nothing. It was very it was very anodyne what I was saying at the time. And he said to me, "That's your uh, that's your privilege speaking." <laughs> And, oh, the and privilege and be- Simon Simon's oh so Simon. so um, so. I mean, in my naivety, I, I wasn't really sh- sure what he was talking about. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, I've one or two other people have said it to me in, in conversations. Mm. And it's been a time where, in a sense, the, their, their argument back to me was that it was my privilege speaking, which to me at the time, and still doesn't seem like a coherent argument yeah. what what's your what's your um, take on on when someone pulls that taller that hammer out of the box <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I think yeah, I'm going off what I've observed anyway but from what I've observed when people have been using that word uh, they seem to use it in a way that says that suggests something such as unconscious bias systemic racism if you are somehow part of an identified collective that is advantaged by the specific rules of the of society or, or or the government or whatever you want to refer to it, then you've got this magical word called privilege. Because you're white, so because you're white and male, therefore you get things that other people just don't get, and that's utter nonsense. Not sort of, only sort it, of on a on a silver spoon. On a silver spoon, yeah. yeah. Oh, you just get it. Right. So you can roll down the. I didn't. You. I didn't realize that. <laughs> if only I'd know. Yeah, if only you'd know, man. It'd be yeah. so much easier. Hey, you need to. I need to steal that from your card later yeah. on in the wallet because <laughs> you know. Yeah, shh. Uh, so the idea of of privilege, I think, it, it, it's it's actually quite condescending as well because what it says is that uh, me as a Pacific Maori guy, that somehow I can't make it because I am underprivileged, and, and I'm thinking, damn, what the hell are you talking about? Because here's my thing. Both my grandfathers fought in World War Two. Both of them, uh, uh, and that's that's, and, a, that's actually a lot more than I can say. <laughs> but they earned they earned the right for me to be able to travel where I want, speak as I want, to be able to go for a job uh, application, to 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 uh, be around and and to do what I want to to a large extent. Um, so for them to talk about the fact that I don't get what others get because I don't have that privilege. Or, or there's some sort of weird uh, privilege. It's not, not just inaccurate in terms of uh, the system, institutions, laws, policies, not just that. It also is highly condescending to what my people, and when I say my people, I mean my white grandfather and my my or my white Māori grandfather and my Pacifica uh, other grandfather. You know, it, it absolutely spits. It's it's a it's a disdain upon the sacrifice of what they did over there. Um, it's it's you know that term, the soft bigotry of low oh, expectations. soft bigotry of low expectations. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Um, I mean, look, I didn't do very well at my some of my exams. Why? Because I was stoned. <laughs> <laughs> it had nothing to do with uh, my skin color being a bit browner than yours. 
you know. Well, well the, the thing is, you know, when, when someone says that to me, you know, I, I am very aware that I am privileged in many respects. I mean, I come from, um, you know, a, a, you know a, a family with a mother and father, people who, who are intelligent, work have worked unbelievably hard and have been very successful yep. and um, have shown me how to be, I'm going to well up, you know, get all teary, but, you know, shown me how to be caring, loving and kind. Yep. yep. Right? Does that make you better than I am? Well, obviously, <laughs> no, yeah. but but so so in a sense, you know, I, I'm incredibly privileged, mm. um, and in a sense, on, in terms of the, you know, some from someone like Simon Wilson, when he, he I, I'm putting words in his mouth, so sorry, Simon, if I get this wrong, but in a sense, if he was here, he would look at you as being less privileged than me, yes. in a sense. Yep. But to me, that is sort of like I can't help the fact that I got born into that good situation, you couldn't help that you got born into the situation you got born into. Yep. Um, I mean, but it doesn't mean, it, in a sense, it, it, it may give me a lead in the race, in the race in inverted commas, but you may be a faster runner. Yeah. I may be really lazy, mm. right? Um, so in a sense, it doesn't, it means something, but it doesn't mean anything. And if you, if you look historically, quite a few of the people who, uh, if we look at even corp, uh, private sector, you know, someone, if you've got a family business, that family business wasn't around in the 1600s or 1700s. And in actual fact, even if you looked at some of the, um, uh, uh, so lands in New Zealand where you've got some Pākehā who actually had some beautiful farmlands uh, and then they got it sw- uh, swiped out and they lost it because of a bad deal that they did. Not with a race, another race, but just within their own uh, areas. And so that all of that land's gone and suddenly they don't have anything and they work back up. And on the other side, you've got other people who grab farmland because this is some stories that I heard um, uh, from some farmers down, yeah. down in Waikato. And then you had some who just came up and, and uh, a, a grandfather made a good deal and suddenly they burst out on scene, awesome. Uh, the father made a bad deal on another grandfather's, great-grandfather's lot, suddenly they lost everything. So the very um, uh, movements about life, what's important is do we have equality of opportunity? Are we all born uh, being able to get an education, that we have a right to, to go for a job that we want, you know, those sorts of elements. That's what's important. This idea of privilege is not so such condescending, it's also inaccurate. Um, yep, yeah, if you've got some dude who's got rich, they've got better access to, well, their parents have got better access to um, a, a, a private education and things like that. So what? So what? Good on them. You know, if their parents made the right choices and so their kids have done or, it, that's or fine. Or didn't they make, they're just lucky. Or they're just, just lucky. lucky. They're just you lucky. Know, they they, they yeah. fell upon a gold nugget somewhere. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's that's life. And we've got it's to harden of... up a bit about that because uh, if you look at it, there's some wonderful... But, you know, again, so if I said those words... Yeah, yeah you, you're I not could, allowed to. I, I'm not allowed to. You're not allowed to. But because you, you've got the right credentials... <laughs> yeah, I've got the right credentials. But, it, but you, you're allowed to say them. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. That's right. So, but no, which, which is, in a sense, silly. Yeah. Because that you can say one I've plus... Got, one. I've you, got privilege. Yeah, you've got privilege. <laughs> but, you know, you, you can say one plus one equals two. Yes. And I can say one plus one equals two. The same. They, they mean the same thing. Yep. So it, it, in a sense, what getting back to freedom of speech it doesn't actually matter who's saying it. That's right. That's right. You know? yep. And and it goes back to actually it even goes so, further. So identity. But it's not would just, you say sorry? Would you say identity doesn't matter in free speech? Identity doesn't matter in free speech. Yeah. But and neither does because that's one part. And the other part because you'll find a lot of these arguments come from uh, 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 academics, heavily duty academics. So they'll argue. You'll also he, get sorry, thing, heavily what? Uh, the, some of the heavily some of the arguments are heavily from uh, academics with lots of letters behind their names and lots of years study. So I was at a debate. Uh, geez, I've done a few debates, but I've done uh, I did a debate with Paul Spoonley. Um, and who's he? He is the main academic for hate. He is a main academic for hate speech. So he's you the one that the for, media not not for it, but against it. For it. Oh, sorry. For for the enactment uh, legisla- of for, the legislation of it. Uh, yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. So he's the main one that the the left and the the media will trot out. He is like the celebrity guy that they'll trot out to to talk about these things. Um, we've actually spoken on different topics. We've been used by media in different topics before uh, on on the same article, but we've never actually met up. So we actually met up about uh, in between the last two lockdowns. And uh, uh, and it was interesting because he, he utilized, you know, he was happy to talk about distinguished professors and and uh, how you know utilization of um, his credentials. He didn't do it 
big time, but it was in there on a couple of parts. And I noticed that a lot of the young people, the young wokies, will utilise that they they are in university, that they are second or third year uh, students, and things like that. Right. And so when they talk, so they've about, got the, they've got the right credentials. Yeah, they've got the right credentials, yeah. and I find that just as they've got as, the brand and the, the got, badge. Yeah. Look, I come from the number one university, and you know, and even then, it's like, well, okay, are you from Otago, or are you from uh, Otago, or are you from AUT? which yeah. apparently gets looked down upon, you know. The, right. So even you're arguing from authority, arguing from privilege, and it's all absolutely nonsense. If I say an idea, if a nine-year-old says an idea, and her her facts are actual facts, and that's a good idea, then it's a good idea based on the merit of what she says. That's what's important. Shouldn't matter that because I wear a lava lava, I'm browner than you, then I should be able to say uh, uh, what the real issues are in Pacifica than you. Mm. Uh, but it is. Because mm. uh, you imagine if if I as a as a person with unbelievably <laughs> low degrees of melanin in my skin was in that room and I said, "Where's your father?" Oh, oh man! So would that have, in your in your opinion, would 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 I've got even more vitriol yes. than you? Oh, absolutely! Yeah. In fact, because in fact, I just what would looks. I know? Yeah, I see. I just got looks, and because right. of my reputation, because I, they they know damn well as to where I come from and what I've done, mm. they could only they could only do the looks. Mm. You would be told to leave the room. I'd be hung, drawn, and oh, you'd be and hung, quartered. drawn, and quartered. Yeah, maybe even crucified. As well. <laughs> Perhaps, yeah, just for good measure. Yeah, yeah. In the ideology that we've been talking about, would you say this? Well, would you say it's puritanical, or is there a degree of puritanism in it? Um, yes, yes, I suppose so. It's not something that I've actually thought about before, but it would, it would, it would be congruent. Because that... if, you, if you think of the Puritans, and again, not that I'm, I'm well versed on on the history of the Puritans, mm. but they definitely weren't um, open to things they didn't like. Would I that, think there's a, right? I think there's a deeper thing. I think, uh, I think, I think it's a bit deeper. One, you've got, you've got a a group, a growing or perhaps not increasing, but you've got a big group of people who have low resilience and they've been jumping on and they want they want the betterment of the world and they're in a sense fallow ground for what I believe the main issue or one of the main issues being is um, is lecturers and professors and to a lesser degree teachers who hold hardened uh, leftist ideological principles and so they've been teaching them and and inculcating in them what they themselves carry so i think that's a big part of the issue so the mob the mob section of it it's not so much that they're even it's just that they've been impressed upon as opposed to really carrying the ideals and therefore carrying an inflexibility around it they just want, and you mentioned it before, that they are coming from good places. They just want the world to be a better place. So they don't quite see it. Uh, I think I think that you've got, yeah, I think you've got a, a double whammy sort of thing going on. I think you've got taxpayer-funded, and I mean by decades taxpayer-funded people who are living in, you know, the whole disconnected ivory towers, all of that sort of scenario, who do view that the government can actually fix all, all human problems. And they've actually inculcated their students over the last two-ish decades, um, def- definitely three decades, but very much so the last two decades, uh, in their own particular ideology. So that's been a transferred area, whereas those younger ones, and I, I would even include even your late 20s guys uh, who who don't really know, understand why, but they just get triggered by the things that look at hurting our people. So... I think the more highly concerning one is the lack of ideological diversity um, in our universities or the ones who, who train slash educate our current leaders, policy makers, the ones who are trying to make a difference in terms of the very institution itself. So if you look at, for example, um, the critical race theory, but then if you Back that into 1979, where they redefined the words in the Treaty of Waitangi and said, "No, no, 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 the, those noble savages had no idea what they were signing. We know what they were signing." So then they changed in 1979. That went through the 80s, and then the racial segregation laws became built upon that. And now we're at a point now today where if you say equality, you're actually racist. 
you the idea of um, equity has now replaced equality. As, as so a what's, e- what's equity? So equity is, yeah, is, is effectively uh, equality of outcome. <laughs> right. Yeah, e- so, so so essentially that's it's Marxist. Yeah, essentially it's Marxist. That's yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. And it, it, well, I mean it's just pure Marxism. Well, essentially, yeah, yeah, essentially nothing. It is Marxism. So because if you have a look, for example, uh, currently and, and what's sorry, what's wrong with equality of outcome? Surely that's a, <gasps> surely that's a good thing. Well, because of course, equality of outcome removes your very uh, free will. It, re- it removes a requirement to engage in human interaction or choice. But but you know, surely that um, you know again, I, I always like bringing it back to the personal. We're talking about you know, let's say I I you know I I I I was lucky when I was born. Right, in terms of having you know good family and all that, that you you weren't quite so lucky. Would you agree with your fam your family background? I I wouldn't. I would say yes. No, I'm okay with it. You're okay with it. Okay. Well, maybe it's a dumb dumb thing. Let's just say two different people. Yep. One, you know, someone who's who's lucky. Someone who's had a rough upbringing. Hmm. What's wrong with helping that that person? Because in in a way, you know, when I because I always try and think um, try and think. You know, an argument that I'm not enamoured with. I try and think, okay, well, maybe they've got a point there, and you know, the point is the the point that uh, is that you know, you've got your mummy and daddy who look after their kids, and they get you know they take them to music lessons, they do them this X Y Z. Okay, we'd all agree with that's not not a bad thing, and you've got the other kid who has nothing, right? Mm. And what's wrong with the state coming in and giving them something? Mm. In a sense, what you're saying, going back to our meeting with Where's Daddy, the the state was, here's a bicycle, here's rugby boots, here's yep. this, that, and the other thing. What's wrong with that? Because longitudinally, it's, it's incredibly damaging. So even to go back to what we were, uh, just to go back about two and a half, uh, well, maybe a minute and a half, um, mum, mum, when mum was 15... She was sexually assaulted by her sister's boyfriend who tried to rape her and stuff like that. She tried to tell her family, no, nah, no go. So that's a horrible thing to happen, absolutely horrible. She scarpered and she ran away to, or she moved away to uh, Bunnythorpe. And while she was at Bunnythorpe, uh, after a horrible thing had happened, then she met a handsome brown guitarist. <laughs> and then my brother and I popped out. We also happened to, um, now dad, dad and mum never advised us, but... I'm about, I'm about nine ten months older than my half brother. Now you do the math, and it's like, yee! so you know when we talk about life, um, I'm glad to be here uh, because if the abortion bill had been around then, how 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 easy would it have been for me and my brother to not be here? Um, I think back to the negative things that I got into, all the drugs, all the alcohol, all the uh, I pushed a girl to to do things, you know. Uh, um, to have an abortion, I, I uh, so I've done some really bad things, uh, but even then, I look back and further along the track, and I've been able to use a lot of my negative experiences to um, save a few lives and actually help a few lives of a whole lot of others. So the whole luck, bad luck thing, which is very common to the sort of say, or not luck, but you know, the occurrences of your circumstances and it's unfortunate, you, you know, all of that sort of stuff. I'm I'm happy with where I am and all of the negative and positive de- the things that have occurred in my life. Um, so, but if we're talking about longitudinal sort of stuff, the reason why it's utterly bad is, and the, the example I give, I always like, I always like uh, examples or parables or whatever people call it. Uh, so Māori is a good example. You know, the idea of equity uh, in Māori, because Māori are a nice control group for, for a while they were. Uh, now, if you looked into, at the 70s, Māori had an 80% chance of being born into a married mum and dad home. So if you're Māori and you were born in the 70s, you had an 80% chance of being born into a married mum and dad and, home. And, but by comparison, what was it for, for Europeans? A little bit higher, a little bit higher. But not much. Not much. Um, right. uh, so Pacifica was higher, uh, and so Asians. Asians e- are almost always like yeah, Asians are almost perfect. always they're perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we all want to be Asian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the seventies, but, but in the sense, you had you had um, equity then. It was, no, no, uh, no, no, but, no, you, you know, did it. no, you did it. No, no, but, but on that on that one, you had one that data point. Oh, see, I wouldn't even call it. Oh, yeah, I suppose you would. Yeah, you're right. You know, I'm, which, I'm attracting, which, I'm attracting which is, current age. Yeah. So you had equity at that at moment. But which is, but, if, if, if you're going to, you know, sociologically, if there's one thing that is going to make a difference is, is having, going to a family 
with the mother and the father. So yes, yes, yes. Just yes, even right. on just even on every resources. every social every You've social two, literature. Yep, yeah. yeah. mum, married, mum, dad in a home. Mm-hmm. Boom, you, you're 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 statistically likely to make it. No you're worries. Privileged. You're, you're privileged. You're um, privileged. As of right now, though, it's twenty percent. So of Maori. If, of Maori. if yeah. you were born today as a Maori, yeah. you have a twenty percent chance of being born so to marry Mamadeo. Similar for for Black Americans, and so uh, you know pre the Great Society. That's correct. In nineteen sixty. Oh, oh, you speak my language. So so yes. Um, yes. the, the, the attempt, exactly the same thing. It the was like to it was eighty. Equity. They'd gone through slavery. They'd gone through Jim Crow. Yep. And I think it was something like eighty percent. And um, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, and so the and whole, now, now it's, it's, you, you're it's right. Linda like Bain Johnson brought in all that stuff to create more equity. Mm-hmm. Whether he did it on purpose or not, I tend to believe, I tend to subscribe to the quote attributed to him where he said, I'm going to have those niggers voting Democrat for the next 200 years. I tend to agree with it, with him saying that. He was quite, he, that was not the only time where he was known to do those sorts of things. And was that a direct quote? It was a direct quote attributed to him uh, while he was flying Air Force One and uh, right. engaged with that. Uh, so they, uh, so you had that situation. And it was, I guess, say with Maori, you had the DPP in 1974. 1974 was absolutely fine. I, I think, I think it was well-meaning. But as soon as 75 hit, suddenly it became more targeted, more easier to get a hold of. And then ever since then, we've had easier and easier benefits to get. And as we've seen that, we've seen the de- the, the the destruction of of the Maori family unit. You didn't see the destruction uh, after 1840 or 1852. Um, and when they started records in 1904 or 5, you didn't see any damage, even in terms of the urban mis- migration to the cities. It, only from the late 70s onwards did you start to see the decline of it. So why is that? What... Because as far as I'm concerned, whenever you want to seek financial equity of a group of people or any sort of equity, what you're doing is you're removing any type of trying to gain equity of whatever it is, whether it's health incomes, uh, uh, health outcomes, for example, with the DHBs now saying that if you're Māori Pacifica, you're going to be put above all the white people. Whether you mean in the, in the queue? Yeah, yeah so currently... So, so Auckland, if, you, if you come after me, you actually get bumped up in front of me? Yes, yes. In fact, that got confirmed uh, uh, about a month ago. So I was able to confirm that in actual fact, a guy who was uh, two years, three months, two years two years, three months on a waiting list for a hip replacement was uh, replaced by a guy who'd been waiting for like two months or so for a hip replacement uh, because he was Māori and the other guy was white. Um, so the but, that's yeah, currently but, happening. But, you know, sorry to drill down on that. What's wrong with that? Because what happens is they haven't bothered to look at why is it that Māori and Pacifica actually have less uh, health outcomes. Now, we know. We know why. So so you're, you're saying it's the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff? Oh, no, worse. Uh, worse it's, it's basically uh, I would say it's worse I'm trying to think of an, uh, taking your analogy it's not an ambulance but so, the so, cliff, so uh, we, we've had the fall and we, we're just focused on we're not, we don't we're not we're not putting security in the fence at the top of the cliff and and dealing with the problem we're just dealing with the the after effects of the problem is that more so you've got people who are not who you've got people who are at the top of the cliff and what you're doing is you're saying, yeah, yeah, keep keep going, jumping over the side of the cliff. Sweet, keep jumping, it's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, because the reason why Māori Pacifica don't have the best outcomes is not because of, of uh, the whole genetics aspect, it's because of the fact that we just don't go to the doctor when we should be. We're scared. We don't go doctor, and now it's got nothing to do with white people or colonials or anything like that. We just uh, we have an absolute, we have a fear on those aspects. A friend, a friend of mine is is a doctor, mm. and he he was in in a city, working working um, at one of the universities, and then he went to move to Gisborne, to um, work in in a, in a Maori community, and he said he went from the um, the worried well to the unworried unwell yes oh well said gosh so you'd you'd, oh, you'd agree with that i i do I not not just agree i tell him that he is correct uh and so what you're doing by saying that now nah, if you're brown then you're going to get ahead of the white people what you're actually saying is hey that's sweet carry on not uh carry on not bothering to come in carry on uh in fact so you're, you should you're continue affirming, doing it. you're affirming um behavior that is less than effective oh to put it yeah, to put it euphemistically yeah. yes yes put it euphemistically yeah, yes very yeah. much so so, so it's sort of the, in a sense you you basically is you're saying there's an economic argument and yep. that you know it's the, the classic economics you get more of what you reward 
well, not just that, not just that. If you give out benefits, you, you make it flash with benefits, what you're actually doing is you're removing the opportunity to be tenacious, to be creative, to be resilient, to be able to learn what hunger is so that you work harder for your kids, so that you, 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 you freak out, uh, you freak out and you don't know what you're doing and you spot an opportunity and you leap on that opportunity and you work it to the bone. Because you know that you've got to do that for your kids. Because you've got to feed your family. You've got to feed your family. Yeah. And no yet, one else is going to feed no your family. No one else is going to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if we have a look at the income levels, if you look at the income levels on average for Māori in New Zealand, crap. Sorry, bad. <laughs> not you very can, or, I mean, it's the podcast. You can say, <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to shock you. This is not BBC. Oi, oi, oi. This is BBC. not BBC. Uh, uh, but you know, and I'm sure, I'm sure you're going to you'll guess correctly, where is it that income levels for Māori are the best? I have no idea. Australia. Uh, yeah, okay, explain. There, are no, there is no treaty. There is no uh, targeted benefit well, for well, Māori. Well, I'm going to even point out, Australia is a lot more racist than New Zealand. Oh, absolutely. In, to... fact, in fact, I remember when I, was, when I got a job there, they, they were going through this thing of saying, we don't want those bloody Kiwis here. We don't want them. They were, they were, politician was straight out sort of saying it. Uh, um, so, yeah. <laughs> You know. So, so you're you're saying, um, well, you know, I'm, I'm being, uh, I'm going to come up with an argument against that. Well, well, Australia's richer, or yep. you know, if if all of us went to Australia, we'd earn more. Yep. Yes. So, How's, how are the Aboriginals doing over there anyway? Probably mm. not that well. No, not that well. Mm. So, what's, human, your, what's your point? My my point is the human species. The human species. We live and we become stronger in an adversarial environment. So we, competition. Competition. When you go to the gym, you don't get you don't get strong muscles by sitting there and and just being relaxing and going to sleep and just by having someone saying mm. pain someone to say, Wow, you got big muscles. That's not how you get big muscles. You 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 put them under pressure, you create resistance to your muscles, you make it harder. You know, you but go see, through hard th- times. But the argument against that is what do you what happens to that sixteen year old girl who's pregnant the guy has been irresponsible. He's run off, not taking responsibility. So what happens to that sixteen-year-old? Yeah, well, that that sort of situation. This is where you come into uh, prevention, intervention, management sort of thinking. Uh, but you got a sixty-year-old girl, and she's pregnant, and the guy's been a scumbag, and he's done a runner. Well, first off, why has she gotten into that situation? How did she grow up in uh, zero to three and three to sixteen? Those and those are actually the big questions. Uh, how did because you look at decision making processes? She would have hooked up with him at some point. She would have been attracted to him before that. She would have been in the position where she wanted to have sex at some point. Why is that? Is there a dad around at all, which you can have a look at there? So if you have a look at at, at uh, you can't you can't gain an, an equity type of thing. As a social welfare part, yes, you've got to make things. You've got to you've got to have a net. The issue is is a tension balance between a net. And a uh, a rope which just um, gets us all tangled up, so we can't exist without it. Or rather, there's a difference between a net that that just keeps you from falling down beneath the barriers, and then giving a teaspoon with a heroin needle in it, uh, because that's that's what the big problem. So you, you're with saying is. you're saying people are getting addicted to to welfare. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And this is the problem with what's with, your evidence for that? What, Oh, the, the breakdown of the family, the, the fact that uh, my stu- many of my students told me exactly how they were going to get money and that it all had to do with the benefit system. They knew the benefit system more than I did. And they even told me as to if they got this the amount of kids, they would be able to get this particular benefits and the attractment. So they're actually, again, going back to the economics, you get more of, of what you pay for um, or what yes. you reward. You're saying, you, is, is it correct to say that... Um, because of the DPB, the DPB for anyone who doesn't know is a a, a benefit when a, an unmarried woman gets um, has a child, they get a benefit from the government. Mm. So in, in a sense, the government replaces the the father in terms of the yep. resources. Yep. Um, um, you're going to actually increase. Well, there's there's. It's almost like a a job. Yeah, it's a, you, you'll have a baby, and, I, and again, I'm, <clears throat> this is a question. I'm not a statement. You have a baby to ha- get the money. Yes, there aren't. It's not a big one, but you do get anchor babies. Um, What's an anchor baby? Uh, an anchor baby is one where you have a baby for the money, yeah, Spe- right. specifically. You know, so, so you're saying it's so that's not, be, but that's not a big phenomenon. It's not a big phenomenon, but it's big enough to be a bit of a worry. And yeah. I can only speak anecdotally on that because right. they're not going to write down. I have yeah, an yeah, anchor yeah, baby. Yeah. 
But but I, I, going back to the data, the DPB I think you said was nineteen seventy four. It was introduced. Yes, seventy four. Yep. So the you know twenty years before from the, the from nineteen fifty four to seventy four compared to seventy four to ninety four. Yep. What's the do you know the the difference in the amount of um, um, people who it, are receiving the DPB? Oh no no no. No, uh, I looked at the family figures, but not the not the DPP figures, uh, or sorry, sorry, not the welfare uh, figures going on there. But when I looked, because my thing's always been about uh, young people at first, and then families overall, and where they come from, because most of our issues that we have actually come directly from the the family structure, uh, married mum and dads, and I do mean married mum and dads. Mm-hmm. I did not grow up in that way. I grew up in multiple homes, but the the um, um, a married mum and dad home by the three main longitudinal studies is the best place for a young person to grow up in, statistically speaking. Mm, mm-hmm. um, and the one thing I will say, though, it, the, the issue why benefits are a big problem is that if you use alcohol and drugs, they make you feel good for a while, and, but you know they're bad. You, like, you just know that you they are bad. Know. You actually know. When you bad. were taking drugs, you thought... I knew damn well that they were they were not doing any good for me, right. that I was blazing my brain out, that I was uh, had a bad relationship with my family. and So I knew all of that. Um, Benefits are a little bit different because when you've got someone who's on a benefit, uh, it, they don't they don't quite see that it's actually taking away things like resilience, tenacity, uh, opportunity, innovation. What they see is that I can fill up the car, I can put milk in my baby's tummy, I can get food with it, and I can get ciggies with it, and, and, and positives and minuses. But I can get coping mechanisms as well. And that's where the, the that, that's where the real hook that welfare dependency comes into play. Mm. And so the more you're on it, the longer you're on it. Mm. Mm. Going back to your your own journey, what was the epiphany, or was there an epiphany that you you know? Because I mean, when when I heard you at that debate, I've got to say this. Um, I mean, I've heard a number of speakers in my life. I've got to say, you're one of the best I've ever heard. Oh, yeah, I put you okay, alongside right, David right. Longy and whoa, whoa, yeah, whoa. Um, incredible, <laughs> you know, orator. I mean, um, Pacific people. Um, you know, obviously not all Pacific people, but you know, there's a the number of Pacific people who excel in in oration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, and you're obviously incredibly smart. You're very yeah, articulate. Yeah. Bloody, bloody, blah. You know, <laughs> and unbelievably good looking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so you know, where, which point, or how did you make that transition? Because that's a very interesting point, isn't it? Because mm. we, none of us, again, you know, going back to the good intentions of, of, of you know, the, the, the woke um, people, um, you know, none of us want, all of us want that person that you were mm. to turn into the person that you are now. Mm. We, want, and we want people to go from dependency mm. to self-sufficiency. Yep. So how did that happen? Uh, probably there'll probably be two points, um, and one point I've only sort of recently sort of accepted. Um, the first point would have been my my probably my conversion to Christianity. Um, that probably led me. Uh, so I was I've been been at different times atheist, agnostic, weak Christian, uh, even dabbled in a couple of uh, different religions. Uh, but then I probably accepted um, Christianity when I was twenty five. Uh, and uh, that was a mighty journey in itself. Uh, that cleared up also uh, things such as uh, you know, self hatred and um, uh, my my addictions and you know all of that sort of stuff. So so that was actually quite excellent. That led me on to uh, able to sort of um, journey a little bit and 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 have a particular bit more of a healthier worldview. And then be able to attach that to real world uh, occurrences. So from from the actual philosophy of Christianity, mm. right? The base of the, the core tenets of Christ, Christianity. Yeah, or rather the perhaps the the yeah prob, probably the the tenets of Christianity, um, but also combined with the experiences that I had within that Christian environment, and that's anywhere from uh, having seen nice supportive families and structures so being able to witness that um and also to other more metaphysical things that probably wouldn't be agreed to by many other people which i totally respect um no, such as oh what i would refer to is sometimes on occasion feeling that what i would refer to what would be commonly known as feeling the presence of the holy spirit uh which just fills you up with a with a great deal of love for inexplicable reasons or illogical reasons uh and and yeah traveling that way um, also met my wife as well. That right. was that was probably quite useful. 
<laughs> Behind She's him, a awesome. great man. There's yeah, a great yeah. woman. Yeah. Well, she, yeah. man, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, she is. She is. So she turned you around or helped you turn you around? Kept me in check. Yeah, Kept yeah. me grounded. She is the she is the solid base. So uh, I would still be doing what I'm doing. Oh, no, I probably wouldn't be. Uh, I fly off the handle. I'm, I'm a bit of a always all, you know, I, I think like that, thinking all different ways. She gave me a bit more focus, strength, mm. anchorage, and, and uh, that's not strong. Uh, in fact, sometimes she says, I wish I didn't marry a save the world sort of guy. <laughs> and she does not mean it. She does not mean it as a as a uh, uh, compliment. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> what, what about this? I mean, as far as I'm aware, the... the um... The brain has become fully mature at 25. Now, you, I find it quite interesting. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Yeah, I think it's quite Very interesting. interesting. You're saying, you said 25. Yep. Um, yep. And, Which, of course, is the, the, the development of the brain. Yeah, and I've seen it with young some young people I know yep. where they've gone through um, not, not your level of, you know, not what you've described, but, you know, definitely not ideal um, behavior. Yep. And then... Yep, you definitely. Know, sort of, you know, 23, the 24. The chemicals, yeah. the, the, the formation, the, the proper formation of the neurological pathways. Mm. And the, yep. I, I think, well, well, neurological pathways, sorry, neurological pathways way w- wouldn't wouldn't count because I still am quick to react. So, yeah. But, but the, no, but what it's actually, of, sorry, I should, I should rephrase that. It's not the brain, it's the executive, it's the frontal cortex. Right. So, your frontal cortex, which is the executive part of the brain, which can can say we should do this on Wednesday and mm. that'll be a good outcome yep. um, and delay gratification, yep. all, all yep. those positive, positive things. That's fully mature as mm. far as I understand it. Again, yes. I'm no, I, it may shock you, but I'm no, <laughs> I'm no brain surgeon. Oh. But, but um, yeah, so I just think that's, that's interesting. Yep. But, you know, it, it could be, um, it, you know, often things in life aren't just one. Yep. One variable. Oh, it's definitely not. Multi-variable. Yeah. Definitely not. Definitely not. Now, yeah. so so the you know um, there'll be I imagine there'll be people who who um, will listen to this podcast and say, oh yeah, but he's a Christian. Yeah, God not, botherer. God, God botherer. Not only that, but he's a Christian <laughs> and he's a conservative. Yes. Right. And you know, just to just for the record, I mean, I'm not a Christian, um, and I've never have been, and all that sort of thing. Mm. But I've. Come. Some of my best friends are Christian. No, I'm kidding. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, I've got, uh, uh, you know, I would never use like, oh, that argument's no good because you're a Christian. Yes, arguing from authority. Yeah. Right. I right. never, and this is one of my big ones, is when I'm in a debate, when I'm in a discussion, I never go to the Bible. I never go to. Right. Um, if I'm going to believe in, in something, in Luke it's got 43. To be. Yeah, yeah. Oh god. Therefore, yeah. I may as well leave because I've won the argument. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Boom! I've got this <laughs> because the Bible says so. Every argument that I make has to be able to be backed up in a secular and logical fashion. Right. Otherwise, what's the worth of it? But you, the the, the inter- there's, there's two things I want to discuss. It's because, and although I am not um, a religious man, um. I, th- in my thinking about, you know, why, why, do, why do things go wrong for some people? And would you tell me if you agree with this. It, it's partly spiritual. And when I use the word spiritual, I don't mean God or anything like that. I mean the sense of the word spirit to be able to have, to get up in the morning and get out of bed. To have the, the it's, it's one of those indefinable words, but it's that thing that, Makes makes us go forward rather than stay stay stationary or go backwards. Oh, you're talking about the the the, the uh, uh, I mean, you're talking about a combination of I wouldn't even say motivation, but I think mostly what you're talking about is is a resilience, the actual wording of resilience, the one that we know yeah, in the field. But I, I wonder, you know, I mean, I just you know, if 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 I spent my life every day. Mm. People were trying to break my spirit. Yep. Right. They tell me, you know how. Well, think of that. That example you hear about in in education, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But the difference between when um, someone, the teacher says, "Yes, you can do it," and the teacher says, "No, you can't." I mean, I am a teacher, and I spend all my life telling people they can can do stuff. And I don't see any point of telling them that they can't do it because mm. what's the point? But if I I could break this, quite, I could easily break the spirit of my students. Yes, you'll never be good at this. Yep. No, you you know every time you come, you 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 make no progress. Um, you're actually terrible. You've got no talent. Mm. I don't know why you're doing it. 
blah, 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 blah. Mm. So I can break the spirit of that person. But in a sense, what I'm doing is building this, their spirit. Yep. And so in my way of, um, you know, my, in my thinking, I've sort of thought, well, is it, you know, the, one of the big things that gets us forward in life is being able to have the spirit, to, to the positive spirit, to keep on going mm. or to make a start or whatever it is. What do you think of that? I, you can I say it's it, a lot of bullshit because <laughs> it may be. <laughs> no, no, I think it's. It, I think it's really important, especially in that, especially in the. See, the reason there's a reason why I say zero to three and three to sixteen, mm. because that three to sixteen part is really important because that's where your neural uh, pathways and these sections of life, for example, where you're, what is work ethic and do I work hard? And then there's other parts where it's what is right and wrong. How do I regard right and wrong? Uh, um, and it's all up until sixteen, seventeen. That then your neural pathways are done, mm. and then. Uh, uh, so I'm in my 40s uh, however old you are however old anyone else is it doesn't matter you, you, that that first that 3 to 16 period really does have the majority of our decision making processes in it if a teacher said you're stupid when you were 4 when you was like 8, 9 years old your entire life you were going to remember that that, that teacher told you you're stupid and that will be in even in your decision making uh, conversely like you say, yes, you can do it. You absolutely can do it. Uh, that will also be in that, that soft spot when that neurological pathways are being built and formed. Um, I think if we're talking about, you know, getting out of bed, moving forward with life, there are a couple of parts, and, and I would I would put that with, um, and I'm, I'm a black hat de bono guy. So, you know, I look at, I try to help the world. Well, do you explain that? So I, 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 so I look at the, so I look at an issue or, or something. I look at so the, Edward de Bono. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I look at some of the negative aspects and the way which I want to do things better is by looking at negative aspects and then so smashing what, it down. What does the black the black hat mean? So, uh, you, the you, black hat means so that, you put the black hat and you start saying negative things, or rather looking at some Isn't of the negative that ramifications. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently I'm black hat and yellow hat. So. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Uh, so, um, so one is about creativity, and the other part is about looking at negative uh, pot- potential negative things from a situation, and then smashing those things in order to make it better for other people going forward. Uh, that's sort of how I how I how I view things and how I fix things. Um, so, we're looking at motivation. I think resilience is a massive one. Uh, uh, Mum passed away in 2017, and it hurt me quite deeply. She wasn't even 60, and she passed away. Um, but my resilience was enabled me to be able to get through that and move forward, have a smile on my face if I had to, always remember her, feel the pain, and to go forward. Uh, the other part of uh, as well is is what I would. Pro- I'm not sure how I would define it. I mean, you, you say the word spirit, but I think there's a deeper aspect in ourselves. And the the negative side of it is we see a lot less of it. And that's when we talk about not just apathy but nihilism. The barrenness of There's no point. Of, yeah, I mean the uh, universe is so big. Yeah, yeah, it's like um that Woody Allen line. You know, the universe is expanding. So why should I do my homework? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> you know, sometimes you look up and you look over the stars and you realise there's an infinity factor to it, and then you start viewing yourself and you see how small you really, really are, and and the the enormity of it can uh, can collapse upon you, uh, and if you spread that out over. Uh, days, minutes, hours, months, days, you know, years, uh, then you can actually engage. In fact, uh, the more the more cruel, the more cruelty based crimes that I've come across with young people tend to come from those who exhibit strong nihilism. Um, when I've looked into when I looked at Tarrant, the the, the Australian dude who, who killed all those innocent people in Christchurch, and I did, I looked at I, I read his manifesto several times before it was, you know, made illegal, la la la. Um, and what I saw there was just a whole bunch of logical and theories and uh, ideas, and partly I think he was absolutely just being a, a confused dickhead. But also, what I saw there was an absolute lack of core. You look at a jihad, lack of uh, a lack of a core, a core meaning, a core thought, a core principle. When you look at a jihadist, you're, you're not average, but look at if, when I've looked at some jihadists who've strapped bombs themselves and killed them, killed other people. You see that okay? Well, they have a they have a belief system. There's a core there. They believe that they're going to somehow be. Uh, well, there's a core there. It comes from their belief in Allah and the uh, Sharia and uh, the Hadith and all of that. But it comes. There's a core there, uh, and so they're coming off that. But when you when you see Brendan Tarrant and some of the more serial killers that I have had a look at. Um, there doesn't seem to be a core. There's a there's more than anything. There's more of a 
a barrenness and emptiness in terms of their life. But couldn't uh, that just thoughts. be the metabolism of their, no, the, bi- the, metabolism, the, the, the biology of their psychology? So, you I mean, mean sociopath versus psychopath? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's very possible. Yeah. Well, no, no. I mean, I, I no. saw some. I saw a lecture on um, brain scans of, yep. of, of of murderers or mass murderers or something, and there's basically just these dark areas where <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. nothing there. Yep, yep. And so, I think if, I've if, seen if, some of that. If you, I mean, mm. the, the, you know, empathy is on a spectrum. You know, some people are highly empathetic. Yep. So. Um, um, yeah. Anyway, um, I'm trying to think of who's the the, the famous um, talk ho show the um, talk ho host oh, talk show host. You mean the um, Clint Sight guy? No, no, the the black American woman. The fucking oh, Oprah. Oprah, of course, <laughs> the most famous. Yeah, the, one. the, the most one. Famous. Yeah. So you know, yeah. she is, she. I imagine not that I've watched much Oprah, but she would be highly empathetic, right? And then at the other extreme, you've got your your psychopath. So, so yeah, you know, I, I mean, so I it's, hard to, across... it's hard to, it's hard to, hard to, um, you know, someone like that. See, I, I've come across quite a few sociopaths. Yeah. But I've only come across who, what, one what, 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 how do you define a sociopath? Oh, a uh, sociopath is generally made and psychopath is generally born. Ah, oh, yeah. okay. So a, a, a true psychopath is, is quite a rarity. I probably... Yeah, they're very rare. Um, luckily. Yeah, very luckily. Yeah. Very luckily because the way they operate is uh, uh, very odd. I mean, I, 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 I think... I don't even think I've come across a psychopath, a, a true blue psychopath. I've come across sociopaths. So, wh- what is a sociopath? What What do they do? So they they, they do similar sociopath? things. So they'll they can operate for quite a while. They can uh, ascertain, but their own their own the way which they make their decisions uh, uh, either has either lacks empathy or has empathy as a compartmentalized uh, removal. It's it's put into a box. So I'll choose what you're doing. So, ah, Kl- oh, Klikinski, the Iceman, you know the the big mafia killer. He was quite well known. He see, he grew up in a very cold house, cold home. He was um, very known just to kill people at a hole. But if you messed around with his family, or somehow you interfered with his family time, he would wait, and then he would be he would kill you in a very brutal way. Um, and so that you know, so there was a trigger point. A psychopath doesn't really have those sorts of trigger points. They could be rolling along for thirty years, no worries, and then they can just stab you for right. no real reason. Right. A sociopath, you'll find that there's a reason. It'd be a horrific reason, <laughs> but there's a stupid reason. reason. None, none but there'll be a, a track you can sort of right. track it a bit better. Yeah. Um, the just going back to what Simon Wilson said at the end of his um, my conversation with him. Privilege. N- no, no. He, so he said he said um, what's important now because when I had that conversation, it was actually not long after the the Christchurch massacre mm. at the mosque. Um, and he said, really, the important thing is safety. So he, was basi- he, he, he said, essentially, safety is more important than being able to say what you like. Safety is more important. Freedom. And again, if, sorry, Simon, if I've got that wrong, but that's how, that's how I, okay. I heard it. Cool, cool. What's your reaction to oh, that? Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> Why? Why not? Well, I mean, so... Uh, uh, so but surely so we, want a, let's, sa- surely well, we let's, want a safe society. Well, so, uh, so, so people aren't killed in mosques. Yeah, so we can look at the the laws that, that Stuart Nash and Jason are doing is these laws will keep us safe. And then when they implemented them, they said these laws have kept us safe. Well, that's demonstrably inaccurate, of course, because I come from South Auckland and currently we're in our, uh, a decade, decade high firearms death by illegal crime. Uh, so currently, in, you know, we're, we're higher than a decade and it's getting higher. Um so it's sort of safety for who? Yeah, yeah, safety for who exactly? Yeah. So uh, uh, and also you can so actually it's, see it's also window dressing. It's it? It, well, it's not even it's just virtue signaling. Yeah, because well, that's what I mean. If yeah. you if you're looking at the the Tarrant himself as an example, he he got a license. He should never have been given a license. He should never have been given that, and that was shown out even in that massive article which investigated the police. Not just dropped the ball, but they enabled a lot of the, the struggle that occurred because. For example, hey, we need to have two uh, friends that we can uh, talk to who you know personally. Well, no, they didn't get that. They got two online friends who admitted they have never met with him personally. So you're talking about not just a flawed uh, uh, vetting schedule, but uh, so incredibly inept that a a, psycho, a sociopathic 
scumbag was able to get through the the very ideas and so you know if they were operating he would never have gotten a license he would never have actually been able to carry out the murders that he carried out um so the laws themselves were horrific and it's something which i I have seen so when you you get that i don't know was it benjamin franklin or whoever who said uh, those who place uh, safety over freedom deserve neither and will, will will not gain either or something like that you know they will not gain either and they'll lose both yeah. um of course he's talking from an outcome point of view as well yeah. you know when you talk about the the war of independence and and the fact that they tried to shut things down and somehow it was supposed to make it safe but really it just it lost them a lot of lives over it um you, that's not actually how you make people safer uh you mentioned oddly enough uh, about how your family had raised you to be loving kind have values in, in those systems and you know if we're looking at preventions prevention sort of uh, mentality yeah if you have a strong family and you get a married mum and dad and then that's actually how generally it goes we love you we care for you please share this love and kindness with other people if it had a preventative measure that's how you do it. intervention uh, you you would look at actually being able to um engage with services who can help people and to counsel them through and things like that and also don't forget at all at every single stage of what the government did in terms of the firearms laws at every single stage they stuffed it completely because of course they were operating from an from a fractured floor that he, he that he should have been given the license in the first place that he shouldn't have been picked up for his travel his travels as friends his, his uh, ideological principles so from every angle it was an absolute failure um and as an outcome level every single time we well not every single time sorry but the times that i've looked into whenever uh, freedom has been sacrificed for safety benjamin franklin's absolutely right you lose both you lose both um i mean you know how long is it until we say that well, you know white people are actually the scourge of new zealand so maybe we should for our safety have you put into certain places to be looked after and so you know then we can make ourselves more productive because you know you're actually the scourge right. how long i mean man wasn't that long ago we seem to be forgetting we seem to be forgetting some really important lessons that are within just the only the last century alone mm. of where these sorts of thoughts carry us well the, the problem is five minutes was a long time ago these days yes yeah yes um the other thing i'd like to discuss um systematic racism oh. <laughs> <laughs> I tell love this me, one. Tell me your experiences as a Pacifica, Maori Pacifica yep. um, person of your experience of systematic racism. Yeah, there is no systematic uh, racism. No, no, there is no there is no obviously, institutional obviously racism. Obviously you're joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear your privilege talking again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is there is but no why, why do you say that? Because but, you know, I I mean I have had um very um you know, very highly educated people yep. tell me, you know, very knowledgeable. Yes. They tell me there's... Well, very racism. intelligent. I think I think very intelligent. Maybe not so much knowledgeable. Right, right. <laughs> so I would say that there is... there is. Well, I wouldn't say it. There is no institutional racism. Zero. Um, th- well, there was none. I think now we're starting to see an area where actually there is starting to be institutional racism, but not against brown people in actual fact in fact i think it's actually against others so uh, um, well, the idea of institutional racism uh, now I, i'm aware that they've actually started to try to redefine institutional to mean something that's not institutional institutional racism has got has, is is a policy or a law that is in the system that we operate in uh, and the great examples is in you know, we mentioned one similarly before is jim crow you know ah oh, if you're black you go around the back to have the horrible taps and toilets it's institutional racism. Or I heard just on that, I heard a, a hilarious sign, um, or saw a hilarious sign on the, you know, from the from the Jim Crow era. It said, "No dogs, no blacks, and no Irish." Oh, <laughs> oh I've seen that. I've seen that sign. Yeah, I've seen that I sign. Mean, you know, I mean, yeah. it's terrible to laugh at it because it's so yeah. awful. Yeah. But um, yeah. But you're right. Uh, yeah. So the. Uh, but what about in New Zealand? Do, did we have systematic racism? I believe. Yeah. So for what I've heard. So what I've heard, Pukekohe might have had some, but I haven't looked into it. Uh, I mean, if they did, if you had it so that only uh, Māori were in the cheap seats and only you know the white people were in the front, oh yuck, that's horrible. Mm. And that would be institutional racism, absolutely. 
Uh, same with apartheid. Apartheid was also social racism. Mm. I'm glad that. I mean, mum, mum stood in the 1981 protest. She was very proud of that, and, so did I. and I'm very proud. Oh, awesome, yeah. awesome. Yeah, I was very proud of that. You know, I was very proud that mum was was one of them. That was awesome. Um, the but but we don't have it, or at least I believe we didn't have it for so long. Uh, now, unfortunately, we're starting to see more racial segregation by power rules. Um, and Wait, say it, that again. Racial racial segregation by power and, and actual enforced privilege. So so we're we're actually reinstating segregation. Is that what you're saying? Racial segregation by power. So what, yeah, and what, privilege. So the example I'll give is one I gave before. So uh, under current um, two DHBs that I know of, and it's spreading to the other DHBs. Uh, will now say if you're Mario Pacifica, you'll be popped in front. Uh, don't worry about it. Yeah. Rather than just being randomly placed in there, or, or rather based off need. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you got that one. You've also got uh, some other elements, for example, cultural reports uh, in sentencing. Cultural reports in sentencing are given, well, you know, you are Māori and uh, you, you, colonisation is a painful thing and so you suffered, so therefore we'll give you some reports. If you're white, if you, so, if so you, you get, do a crime... You, so you get a, a lesser sentence. You get a lesser sentence. Because if, of colonisation. Well, because of a cultural report that can only occur if you're from a, uh, a, a viewed upon cultural background or ethnically cultural background so if you do something it doesn't matter you uh, you you do not get a cultural report i do mm. so if we do both a crime i'll get less just because simply the, because the melanin in our skin a, a melanin in our skin mm. um so so when you look at it now there is starting to be that and i i hate it i i i man i rip rip across it quite strongly in fact i went to rotorua and i've been in a couple of marae to to slam it down and <laughs> get some fun stuff back in return so, um, so when you go into Marae, the the consensus that they think it's a good idea, that sort of thing. Yes, yes, they do. And why? Why? Because because of what they've been told by people who should know better. So when I I commonly say race baiting, uh, race hustling politicians and race hustling academics, that's generally what I call them. And I call them that because they make their power, authority, and money from the uh, from dissension within racial groups in New Zealand. If, as long as there's racial tension, then they make more money, they get more popular, and their their things are to be more credited. I'll give you an example, actually. I'll give and, you an example. Uh, yeah, can I just point out something? Mm. There's never a, a scenario where they want less of what they, they're fighting yes, against. Yes, that's right. Yes. Because, because that's actually, they'll sell less books. Yes, yes. Yeah. If yeah. once the problem is solved, <laughs> yeah, yeah. they're unemployed. Yep. Yep. So turkeys don't vote for Christmas. That's that's absolutely right. Mm. Uh, which are and that's why I love being part of a youth worker field. You ask a youth, and and not just me, but a youth just, what? Uh, ask us to a youth worker. Next time you ask a youth worker, uh, uh, tell them you know what the outcome of your job is, uh, outcome of his job is. Because yeah, you're right. From academics, for most academics, no, for academics, always no. Oh, oh, they'll talk about you know ongoing sort of stuff. A youth worker. Why are we in this job to make ourselves redundant? That is why that's, we're in youth work. That's actually what I say about myself as a teacher. My ideal scenario is I become redundant. Oh, see? Because, you know, the student is, becomes, is, becomes, becomes wonderfully self-sufficient. bigger than us. And, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And my ideal is they become better than me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I've, I've actually had that and I felt, mm. <laughs> we've had a good laugh about it. Because yeah. I've had some who, who actually earn more than I do. Yeah. So good on them. Mm. Um, but when it comes to, uh, sorry, we were talking about uh, racism and then we... The, the, um... You're talking about the, the the race hustlers. Race hustlers. So yes, so so the race hustling academics and, and the politicians. Uh, yes. So what they're engaging in is, um, oh gosh, I hit my train of thought, but uh, I lost my train of thought. It's all right. So yeah, you had your race hustlers, race uh, uh, politicians. They are happy. Ah, oh, that's right. So in the marae, so in the marae, they're being told by these other guys to just keep it on and, and keep on going. Oh, the re- what uh, the example that I'll give is Dar Al Fano report is a report by Action Station, who are a group of academics, and they uh, put together this report and they gave it to uh, Andrew Little. Andrew Little is very well known to be very attracted to these types of reports. And, and again, just for people who don't know, Andrew Little, Andrew is Little Minister is the of Minister of Justice. Right. Um, I I might refer to him affectionately as the Minister of Truth. So. We'll <laughs> From from George Orwell's from George Orwell's uh, lovely right. lovely uh, mm. uh, you know beautiful beautiful, beautiful 1984 yeah uh, so the so Dara Alfano report 
uh, sort of had a why are there so much Maori in prisons? Because Maori make up fifty one, fifty two percent, and of, they're ten percent of the population. Well, well yeah, they're roughly fourteen point nine. Fourteen. Uh, yeah. So they they went in there and they said, well, why are so many? Why are Maori so and much and and can I point out it's Maori men? Maori men. Am I correct? Well, actually, the the, the, the so, for, uh, so actually the 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 percentage is much much higher in women's prisons. Right. Much wow. much higher. Yeah, okay. much I didn't higher. Know that. Uh, can't remember exactly, but I think it might even be in the seventies. Wow. Uh, so it's a lot higher. Which uh, is unbelievably unbelievable. Yeah, now, yeah. how is that not systematic racism? Oh, yeah, interesting question. So uh, there are. But I am, I am actually I oh. am actually serious in a, in a way. Oh, family breakdown. Yeah. If you want to get down right to the core of it, so the uh, system because, of the family is being because don't forget that that if even if you've got fifty, so if even if you've got fifty one percent of of all Maori in all prisons, uh, you're still looking at less than five percent. It's about three percent of the entire population of Maori. So you're still looking at a, at a very small minority. Now that's right. still too many because that's that's what five five fifty one hundred or so prisoners are Maori. What's a what's a big one? Well, you want to go to the pattern response there. You want to find what is the highest factor in all of the prisoners. Is it race? No, it's not. Is it ed- education? Now, education, uh, education is, seems to be the second highest, but the first highest is that they came from a broken home. So, but, in a but, sense, just to, just to clarify that, the majority of of Maori prisoners come from bro- from majority of all prisoners. All, all prisoners, sorry, yeah. all prisoners, all prisoners, yeah. regardless of regardless of, of everything else, melanin. It's, Melanin, <laughs> you um, ha- come from broken homes. Broken homes, and, and now, just, just out of interest, what, so what are we talking? Ninety percent. Oh, and that's that's exactly what I was going to say. Mm. We don't know. Do you know why we don't know? Because we don't have any figures on that. We're not allowed to ask. We do, well, we don't ask. Mm. Overseas asks. So in the US and over in uh, most of Europe, oh sorry, some of Europe and Aust- I don't know about Australia, but especially the US, which is a very which is a reasonably comparable country, they ask. Canada asks. New Zealand doesn't ask that question. And, and what is it if these are comparable countries? What is it? Uh, uh, so the last amount of record I had was um, high eighties, uh, low nineties, uh, in terms of those figures that I had over there. And that equates to what you were saying earlier that before nineteen seventy four, the Maori family Pretty stable. was t- was eighty percent, and now it's twenty percent. Yeah. So if you if you got twenty percent of or eighty percent of people. Yep. Who are not brought into mum and dad homes, yep. and the eighty percent of all prisoners yep. come yep. from those broken homes. And interestingly there's enough, a, there is a pretty one-to-one correlation there. And the other, the other big one is about, and you sort of alluded to that uh, earlier with with about Black Americans, uh, uh, is that in New Zealand, and the, the latest data that we have, in, which is from twenty thirteen, so we need newer data, but is that eighty five percent of all solo parent homes are women, mum. 15% are male. So you've got a situation there where, where you've got 75% of those uh, kids are not they're not really having... Well, we don't know how the quality of their thing is with the family, but they're, they're definitely not living with them. And that's a tragic, tragic thing. And I, I'm going to expect that uh, we're going to have more and more of that as we go on. Which is horrendous. Oh, uh, it is, it is. We, and the, it, it, the downstream. Oh, effects. in the youth field, in the youth field, this is not contentious. Uh, family breakdown. Right. So why don't we ask that question? And, and that is a great question, and I don't have an answer for that one. I don't know. Uh, it makes... how, okay, well, another question. What? How would it help knowing that? Oh, because it would give us a direct uh, understanding as to why. You know, is it because of skin color? Is it because of institutional racism? Is it so, because? So of... you, it means you know where to point the the the, the target. You know, it's, it's data. Yeah, yeah. We know. There's nowhere. There's no. We we know nowhere to, to head. In, in the same way that we know that from the three big longitudinal studies in the world, because we we know that if you are raised in a married mum and dad home, then you are more likely to go into the middle class, more likely to engage in positive decision making, less likely to engage in alcohol and drugs, and uh, crime, crime yeah. uh, suicidality killing other people so you got you got all the negative actions and all the positives yep. and you know, one leads one leads to the other um so why didn't that happen to you then you know again go oh, oh, i was i was there you were there yeah even yeah. when i even when i all up until i uh, became christian which i befriended a particular malaysian family they mm. took me to church and then i sort of gave my life and boom and even then it was only because the dude the guy, the pastor, I've been used to other preachers who had white clothing and I'm sure I saw a shiny halo on their head, you know, but they didn't know me. 
Come on, they didn't know me. It was only this particular guy who said, oh, I was heavy into drugs and gangs, stuff like that. And then that allowed me to align a little bit with accepting of what I viewed as uh, um, the Christian influx. Mm-hmm. Allowed that and it went on. But even up until that point, I was uh, uh, every day, every day, uh, every day I was stoned out of my head. Uh, and then maybe two or three days out of the week, I was drunk as hell. Uh, so, so I think it was just perhaps... The reason why I think I, I had it okay was because I was given a strong work ethic uh, when I was younger. Just a real... I mean, Dad was... Ugh, mow the lawns every week, dishes all the time, mop the floor every day, dusting the floor. You know, the, everything was had to be done. Switch saying I hated it. But. So the culture of the family, and I'm not talking about whether you, you, you're Malayan or, yep. you know, yep. come from Timbuktu or, you know, come from yep. Remuera, both, both sides. But the, the, the culture of the family in terms of what the family values and the expectations yep. are fundamental yeah yeah yes i, I would say so how, how you've grown up uh, again so, again the soft the soft the soft neurological pathways which uh are building you you know what is a work ethic what is right and wrong and, and those elements i've picked up some of the negative aspects so i'm quick i can be quite uh, i can i i feel myself growing highly violent if certain occurrences occur and I can identify that and then I can pull in my own little measures of how to do that and that comes from you know those sorts of early days um, I react quite quickly uh, it's, it's partly called being a male yes it is um, we, we, I, we, we I are, suffer from we the are, same thing yeah we, we, are, we are designed you know, in such a, a way a long line of <laughs> yeah, um, people who do that yep. yeah mm. what is conservatism Oh, I love conservatism. <laughs> what is conservatism? Because I actually think most people don't know. I think there's a, I mean, you can look at Edmund Burke, you can look at the US political system. I, I would multifacet it. So the first angle I would say is that it is a truly centrist, it is the one power of restraint to the excesses of the individual and the state. So when you look at the the political spectrum of left and right in terms of the the American style, where left is very much about the state, the state controls all and everything, and everything exists there, and the right is the pure freedom aspects, the anarchy, the might makes right, oh, my individualism crosses yours and over. Whereas the conservatives is right in the middle, they are a centrist, they keep the excesses of the state and the individual at bay in itself and conduct this general area. Um, the traits of a conservative, of course, I, I believe, is patriotism, pro-family, pro-Western culture, because that is the conservatism that I that I go by. Um, and yes, there is some averse. If you are going to change something, you better have a damn good reason why you want to change it. So, conservatives not against change. No, no. Because a lot against... of people, a lot of people. Well, I well actually, I'm going to speak from my own experience. Mm. Um, I used to think. Um, well, conservatives, they just they don't want to change anything. They're retrograde. You know, they just want to live in the past. Yeah, yeah. Right? Cobwebs and... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> We're know. scared of change. We're yeah. scared of change. Um, um, all things change. In fact, a conservative knows that all things change. It's why we have built the system the way it is. Because we we are strong and then we are weak. And then we are good and strong What, what do you mean to be strong and then we're weak? So a conservative, uh, uh, a conservative understands that that mankind is infallibly is infallible. We are weak. We are structured. We will be strong at times. We'll be weak at times. We'll be rich and poor, and we'll be all of the various things. Yeah. In that other we words, understand. there's chocolate and and yummy food out there. Yeah. Right. Always. And Always. I will and I I will be weak and I will be strong <laughs> yeah. sometimes. Well, not just that. Even in the we resp- Life is pain. We know that life is pain. So the tragic view of life. There's tragedy of so life. They... Yep. So the very society that we build is there to advocate and, and be strong for the weak. Um, to keep And again, to keep the excesses of the individual, the excesses of the state from spilling over. Um, we understand that. That's also why, for example, we are against euthanasia. We understand that, yep, if you want to kill yourself, you will go and you will kill yourself if you're strong. But if you are weak, and then you have you you get a terminal illness and you feel like you're a burden to the family, then you will kill yourself as well. And we've seen that overseas. Um, so that's why we as conservatives are so strong against euthanasia. It it looks like a nice thing on the surface. Oh, you know, I choose myself to in order to do it. But it comes with a hefty price tag, and the price tag is the deaths of innocent and the weak. And that's what a conservative does not do. A conservative has it, so they shouldn't in that one. Um, I also believe in Burke. 
So I've, I've, I love Burke. I think. Tell Burke. me, tell me more about Burke. Burke. Just Ed, Edmund Burke, um, Enlightenment thinker. Yes. Yep. Um, from the from the the um, the eighteenth century. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. So he was yeah, he, great philosopher. I think. Uh, I well. I mean, he's sort of the father Burke, of, father of conservative. He was the father of conservative Burke. Um, uh, uh, um, oh, gosh, Burke and um, the great Catholic uh, philosopher as well. Augustine. Augustine, yeah. Yes, yes. So Augustine and... So there's those guys, Thomas Sowell, these are the guys who sort of build my own sort of uh, thoughts and processes. Um, and, and Edmund Burke had this word, and it goes at the core of, I suppose, who I am. Um, and no, he didn't... No, sorry. Sorry. No, no. This quote has been attributed to him, but I don't think he actually said it. Because uh, I've never seen it, and I don't know if it was there. But, but anyway, the quote that's been attributed to him is... The only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And that is how I've sort of led my life. And I have failed on a couple of occasions. I have uh, stood back on a couple of occasions where I knew I should have stepped forward. Um, so I know my, I'm definitely not perfect. I've got a whole bunch of sins on my, my little plate. Um, but it is something that I strive for and protect. It is also something which I'm aware that I may die for. And I have absolutely no desire to be a martyr. But there have been occurrences, even over the last uh, couple of years, that have led me to accept that that may be the cost of what I stand for. I have, I have no, I have no desire. I want to be a grandfather and great grandfather. I want to hug my kids. I want to die with my family around me. Um, but I am aware that there have been a few instances that have led me to understand that there may be a, a price for what I'm doing. Mm. Well, I think it's a great place to end it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much, Elliot. It's mm. been a great discussion. Yeah, fuck all we lucky. Thank you so much. I, I really do appreciate the, the chat and it's a great chat. <laughs>